test. We'll call the meeting to order right now and roll call. Director Balboni. Present. Vice President Jaffe. Vice President Jaffe. Is there. We can see you, but your microphone isn't working. Give me vertigo. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Vice President Jaffe. Unmute yourself. Oh, he's muted. He, yeah. he is muted. Yeah. Vice President Jaffe, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. It looks like Bernie. Vice President Jaffe, I think can you can you speak? We should be. I am not able to hear oh. what's going on. Josh, can you hear us? Jaffe, I can hear you. Can you hear them, Josh? Not. It looks like they're muted. We're we're muted. It's very strange. I don't know. This makes you wonder about 2023 and the future. It looks, it's ridiculous. Oh my God. looks like you're muted too. Oh yeah, I just muted myself. I, I can unmute. Okay, I see. Technology isn't always what it's cracked up to be, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, Vice President Jaffe, can you hear us? I can now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Director LeHue? Here. Director Lather? Present. And President Christensen? Here. Said yes. I said yep. Okay, so we're uh, there is no public hearing today. Uh, this is uh, item three or on uh, item three with uh, the board members. Any board member who wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda should do it now. One. Uh, yeah, the four point seven. What's on tap? I have some comments, okay. and then just. On 4.6, if sometime staff could address when we as a board will get an update on the optimization study. I'm not pulling it, just okay. eventually. Okay. Uh, anyone else? No. Okay. Uh, I was going to pull 4.7 as well. Okay. Well, do you want to pull it or not? Okay. Okay. That's the one I want to pull. Oh, okay. All right, uh, then um, anyone who from the public who would like to comment on the consent agenda, this is the moment to do so. Hello, uh, my name is Becky Steinbrenner. I have comments on different items on the consent agenda. First of all, regarding item 4.1, approval of the minutes, in all of your minutes, it always says there was one public comment, two public comments, but there's no indication for the public as to what the comment was. The uh, 
the topic. And because the board does, um, is a bit behind posting the videos of meetings, there's there been nothing um, posted for October at all. The public has no way of, of going back and seeing what were those public comments. So I would request that you add at least a generalized content topic of what public comment is. Um, regarding the production reports, I note that um, in, uh, it's on page 150, I think that's part of that. There was a huge spike in uh, water consumption for the month of October. And I wonder why that is. Um, water revenue on page 148 shows that it is very high, nine, nine million dollars. So uh, I guess the dollar amount's good, but what caused that big spike? <clears throat> Regarding item 4.5 in general, I am very concerned that the public and your board have not re received um, timely financial status reports. Here it is, a whole collection from July through October. And I did see that this has happened as a result of Mr. John Cole's request that that information be put out. Thank you, Mr. John Cole, <laughs> because this has not been forthcoming and transparent. Thank you. Any other comments on the consent agenda? I'll move approval of the consent agenda, minus 4.7. I'll second it. Director Balboni. Yes. Vice President Jaffe. Yes, but I would like to comment after the vote. Director LeHue. Yes. Director Lather. Yes. And President Christensen. Yes. Your comment? Yeah, it's just asking staff, um, how long does it typically take to get a, a video posted online? So CTV is who posts the recordings on YouTube. Once they're on YouTube, we can link to them to our from our website and Typically, what we do is once the minutes are approved, we then link to the video because it's a cut. You can do both at one time updating the website. So we rather than post it right away, we wait for the minutes to be approved at the next meeting. That's the current workflow, but we could check. We could have CTV email us once they've posted on their YouTube and notify us and then we could post it. Yeah. Um, well, in a way, it makes sense to to have them both come on at the same time because you know after you see the minutes, you that would guide you on where to go in the meeting. So I don't have a problem with that. It's just if if there's some uh, holdup then uh, I think I think that we'll have to consider doing something, you know, a different workflow. And then the, the financial status reports, I, I think this is atypical to get four in a row. So um, is that, that's true, Leslie, right? That, that this is just an unusual situation. That's correct, yeah. Normally you get them monthly. Okay. All right. Just want to check on that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, number five, oral and written communications. This is the opportunity for. Well, I think we have 4.7. I think we do it at the end of the meeting. At the end. Yeah. At the end. I'm sorry. That's right. Oral communications, who would, wishes to speak right now on an item that is not already on the agenda? Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner. Um, 
I want to make sure that the public knows that tomorrow is the close of the public comment with the Central Coast Water Regional Quality Water Quality Control Board for um, a reopening of the public comment for the permit for the Pure Water SoCal project uh, injection and also the uh, uh, pollution control permit to dump the um, treatment effluent into the bay. The thing that has changed um, since the comment period originally closed, as you know, I'm sure you know, is that um, the Water Quality Control Board has required the amount of nitrate that the project would inject into the groundwater and thereby degrade the high quality of the groundwater um, has, has been required to be reduced. From um, initially it was at 3.5 milligrams per liter and now it says it will be reduced to 1.67 milligrams per liter. That's still a lot in my book for what is called an advanced purification treatment system. The way that nitrate is removed from treated sewage water, and that's what this is, is by reverse osmosis. What worries me is that I think that the um, treatment is being um, designed to use the least amount of electricity possible. Your consultants have already said reverse osmosis is an energy hog, and it is. And uh, that's why a lot of people have shot down desalination in the past, because of the energy use. The Pure Water SoCal project will take a lot of electricity to operate. And by reducing the pore size, um, it take to filter out a lot of these contaminants like nitrate, it takes a lot more electricity. So it worries me that this Pure Water SoCal project is going to allow still a lot of nitrate to go into our very pure Burisma aquifer groundwater. And what worries me is if it's letting the nitrate through, what else is it letting through? And I, um, I worry about this a lot. And um, I would like to ask that, if possible, the design, which is being changed again now, <laughs> uh, be even further honed in to remove as much of the nitrate as possible and thereby other contaminants. Thank you. Since there's a lot of misinformation in there, can, can I ask staff to correct that, please? Yeah, we'd like a clarification. Thank you, Tom. I mean, sorry, there's just so much wrong there that I want to, we, we don't change the pore size suddenly for our planned reverse osmosis membranes. That's just one thing. I'm not having a conversation. I'm asking for a clarification for the public. Sure. Thank you. Um, as part of the Pure Water SoCal project, we are undergoing permitting currently with the regional board. The treatment process still does have the microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and the UV advanced oxidation. <clears throat> it also has a pretreatment step. With the uh, progressive design build and with working with the city of Santa Cruz, we did do a modification to the pretreatment, which was part of the entire um, public process that we did through CEQA. With that, um, the water quality has changed, which we have notified the regional board. The Division of Drinking Water and the regional board and EPA set the water quality standards that agencies, whether it's surface water, groundwater, or recycled water, or desalination, all have to comply by. And so with those requirements, we have shown and demonstrated a couple of things. Yes, the water quality parameters did change with the difference in the treatment technology. And we have shown <clears throat> that in the case that's out there right now is that there have been changes in both nitrite, TDS, and chlorides. The nitrate value did go down, but it's still less than the background. And while we do agree that our groundwater is of high quality, unfortunately is not as pristine because it is facing 
seawater intrusion and contamination. And so that really is, I think, the, the primary objective of the project is to stop that seawater intrusion from coming in and contaminating the drinking water wells, since this is solely our source of supply. So we are working with the regional board on ensuring that we can meet the water quality parameters of the state and federal guidelines. And we will be having to report that um, as part of the permitting process once the project is operational. I'll just yeah, add, I was just gonna also add, it's like it's proven technology. The, the whole treatment process is still the same. The only change was in the pre-treatment, which is before it even goes to microfiltration. Go ahead. Now, I'll just add, uh, in addition to Pure Water Soquel, we have had a demonstration project for chromium, naturally occurring chromium-6 in our groundwater. Uh, and the state has changed the limits on that, so we will be coming back. Engineering's plan for that now, I think, around a $10 million uh, system to remove naturally occurring chromium-6 in our aquifer. But in addition to the naturally occurring arsenic that is in our aquifer that we treat for, in addition to the anthropogenic TCE that uh, we won in court with uh, litigants to help them pay for the removal of that. So we have several um, ways and methods to try to clean up the aquifer. Thank you. And I, I would just like to, to go on record that I appreciate that the staff is always looking for ways to get our water cleaner and that they appreciate that the, the board in the past and uh, probably into the future will always opt for cleaner water, even if there's additional expense involved. Yeah, and that's been the proven track record, certainly with uh, arsenic and other chemicals. The board's gone beyond the, the call of duty. My name's Chris Kirby. The financials not being given to us for the last four months is very suspect and I'm curious and I do thank John Cole for bringing that to your attention. The water harvest event, I was going through some of the financials. You spent $2,500 on a band. How many people, ratepayers were there? A face painter was $1,040, $540 on Togo sandwiches. Complete waste of our ratepayer money, complete. Um, I was also going, you spent $932 on a gaming monitor. What in the world does a water district need a gaming monitor for? Um, throw pillow, I mean, it's just Disneyland Hotel, $20,000 a month to, or for one month to lobbyists. Bulletproof glass in the lobby, that's awesome. That might say a lot about what's going on and how people feel. Um, what are you doing to cut back on spending is my big concern. I, I see nothing. You're still giving bonuses, raises, spending like there's no consequences. Um, Leslie said in the webinar that you've not hired any new employees, but in the financials I noticed you have some uh, temp employees every month, so that might be a way of, of being able to say that but getting, and getting around it. And she says there's an $11 million shortfall. I can't find it in the financials at all. By raising our rates, you're making housing very expensive for people. Excuse me, Ms. Kirby, this, this item's on the agenda. This is for items not on the agenda. So when that item comes up, the rates, you can speak to the rates. Okay. Right, so you'll, you'll need to wait if, it, if the item. Okay, I also, can I talk about the salt water intrusion? Anything that's not on the agenda that's relevant in the purview of the district, yes, you may. Last November, the state paid for a salt water intrusion study, and we've yet to see the results. I think it's because it's not as bad as you people are saying it is. I'd love to see the results and be, and be proved wrong on that one. Um, the Pure Water Soquel, most, most customers, you say it's, three out of four, or I, or I forget what your numbers were, maybe seven out of 10 agree with it, uh, but with Pure Water Soquel, no, we don't. I sat out in front of Deluxe Market for two and a half hours one day, not one person was in favor of it. Um, why are ratepayers paying 38 ex-employees healthcare premiums for a total of over $17,000 a month, every month? 
Why are we paying for that? I don't understand. That's not good contract negotiations for our benefit. We're the ones paying. You people act like this is your piggy bank and you can just do whatever the heck you want. It's not for our benefit, the rate payers. Uh, why aren't you going to other agencies to, to um, combine and, be, and bring them into this ridiculously high cost of Pure Water SoCal? It started out at 60 million, and now it's gonna be over 200 million? It, it's, un, it's, it's just very unreasonable. You need to bring in lo, other local water agencies to share the costs. So, okay, I'll speak about that later. I have a bunch of petitions that people have signed if you'd like them too. I will leave them with you before we're gone. Thank you. Anyone else? I wanted to report on the water use um, conference that we attended. Um, for me, it was my first big water use conference, so it was very exciting. And I certainly um, learned a ton from lectures. But I was um, wanting to kind of share with you about the feeling from all the water engineers in California that were at this huge conference who look toward our district as the, um, the model, the role model to follow. And I was patted on the back by all these amazing intelligent water engineers saying, you know, you are the forerunners. And I just wanted to share that with everyone, how um, super smart water engineers uh, are, are saying that this, you know, they want pure water SoCal, they wanna follow us. So just wanting to share that. And then one other quick thing is I had this great idea. I don't know if it's good to bring it up now, but I wanted to think about in, um, starting a youth board, like maybe a standing committee for youth. And I thought it would be really cool to maybe um, focus on climate disruption and um, things that they're very interested in, like also emergency preparedness and get more youth involved. So maybe the, the district could like check into that or give me history on that. We definitely can. Uh, I don't want to go into it because it's not on the agenda, but Scotts Valley has a good model where they actually have junior members on the, the board. I don't think they have an actual, well, anyway, they, they have deputized little junior members. Yeah. So cool. A cool model. Okay, thank you. One other thing from that meeting, um, it, it was not just the other water districts, but it was regulators too that were all in favor of what we're doing. You know, the, the state is clearly going to water reuse in a big way. I mean, and so even though we're small, we're, we're, we are leading the way. And then one of our, they give an award um, to a staff member throughout the whole state that, you know, is in, in their judgment, uh, you know, just an excellent staff member. And, and our own Melanie Schumacher, Mal Schumacher won that award as staff person of the year for the whole water reuse organization. So I wanted to congratulate her and we're lucky to have her. Yeah, I, w I was at that meeting too. It was uh, it is a really good uh, technical meeting to learn about desal, well, not desal so much, but water reuse. But really that was the, that, the feedback that I got from other participants in that meeting. The state, both the state and federal governments are recognized that we were a role model for other small communities in the entire California coast. We're all looking, all of us along the coast are looking at uh, drier conditions, seawater intrusion. We are working to solve that. So um, yeah, it's been a rocky business to get there, but we've all been working extremely hard to get there. Well, let's see what's next here. Any other comments from the public? Okay, uh, is there, a, I think it's a report that's district council, Josh? You yeah, thanks, board? President Christensen. Um, just gonna start kind of providing an overview of, of some of the new legislation um, over the next couple of reports. Um, and then this, e this evening, I just wanted to highlight um, a Brown Act bill. Um, this bill essentially extends the Brown Act remote meeting rules that we've been operating under with some minor modifications um, going forward. 
Uh, those rules have been initially set to end at the end of this calendar year. Um, so we'll continue to be able to use the just cause and emergency standard to allow um, uh, directors to attend meetings remotely. Um, so more, more information to come on the exact specifics, but just wanted to note that. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I didn't understand. Did you say that uh, there's a new law coming on? So it, in... it's a new law, but it's really an extension of the existing rules. So the existing Brown Act rules were actually set to expire at the end of this okay. calendar year for remote meeting access. Um, and this bill extends them indefinitely. Okay. So Thank we'll we're, uh, um, be subject to the same rules going forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> any comments from the public on that? Okay. Uh, we're at, on administrative business. That's page 231 on the board packet. You should be interested. Uh, 7.1 conditional and unconditional will serves. It's the approve the subdivision agreement for Aptos Village, phase two. Finally. Yes, good evening, board. Um, the applicant, uh, Barry Swenson Builder, is here in the audience if you have any specific questions, but hopefully the memo and the attachments summarize it accurately for you. Um, they have returned and paid the balance of fees, and that's over a million dollars, and there's a receipt in the packet to document that. This is just for the remaining portion of the project, phase two is what it's called. And uh, there's also a revised subdivision agreement that's been reviewed by district council and actually executed. And they have also, the applicant has recorded an uh, exhibit that agrees to pay for any increases in fees as they are implemented until up to and including when the meter is set. So. If it does go beyond another year or so, then any increases will be paid for additionally. Um, I don't know if there's any specific questions on, on this that you have, but we're recommending that the board authorize uh, the president to sign this and we move forward. Could you just highlight if there are any changes from the previous last we saw previously changes to the project or to the agreement to the agreement uh yeah this this agreement uh says that their their fees are not uh, locked in and they're not guaranteed the lower prices so that's the million dollar increase in water capacity fees um there were some other you know changes that I actually don't have in front of me, but they were reviewed by um, Josh. Wasn't, wasn't, you know, originally it was just asking for to extend again. And we said, no, we've got to treat them like everybody else. They've got to come back and just do an, a start it with a new agreement, right? Right. The, this project is, is very, <laughs> very dated. And, and so the original agreement that was entered into, um, has been updated years ago. And so now we're, we're using the current approved agreement that district council has approved. So, let me see if I'm muted or not, sorry. We hear you. Okay, good. Um, so there's two years, right, on this agreement to get everything in place. Did I read it correctly? Yes. But even within the so, two years, if there's an increase in water capacity fees, they'll be on. They'll, they'll have to pay the difference. So how do we, you know, having a a set timeline for it helps us plan for water use um, and how do we, I guess it's really up to, to the builders to adhere to that. Are there any penalties if they don't adhere to that? Well, yeah, the, the sooner they get their meters dropped, 
the sooner they can not be subject to increases in fees. So if if it goes uh, you know beyond that, there there's increases in fees that they'll be subject to. Um, I believe they've already poured the foundation, so I, I was told they're ready to go, and I don't anticipate this to take two years. Yeah. Yeah. For the for the infrastructure that we're talking about. Okay. It's good to hear. Any comments from the public? Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I um, I looked over my notes from that meeting in March, March twenty uh, first of this year, when um, Swenson Builder was looking for an extension of the variance that they got for phase one. What was not really, um, I was happy to hear that you said, we have to treat you like everybody else. Thank you for doing that. What was not determined was whether or not the district was going to grant the um, developer, it was Mr. Uh, Jesse Bristow that was here, um, to waive the labor charge of the district for the meter drop fee for all proposed sub meters. Um, they were asking that you waive that and not charge them for the labor that your, your district provides, is required to provide to, to check on all of this and make sure that it's correct. So is, what is the status of that? aspect of this approval. I would, would appreciate an answer to that. Thank you. Do you want to have a, can we have a confirmation on that? Is it, where is the representative from Mass Health Board? Oh, just a confirmation of that. That was a question that arose in March. I think Taj is probably best to address any questions. You want us to, to respond to? Respond to that specific sure. question. Sure. Okay. Uh, page 242 of the packet lists all the fees that are, that are included. <laughs> and there are... 41 labor only drop in meter fees for submeters $90 each now the the tr the normal um, drop in fee that is normally charged for regular meters includes the actual water meter uh, this is the labor only because the uh, applicant in this case is supplying those submeters so we will be charging we did collect or the labor on that. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll move approval of the subdivision agreement. I second. Director Balboni. Abstain. Vice President Jaffe. Yes. Director LeHue. Yes. Director Lather. Yes. And President Christensen. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this is item 7.2, request board direction regarding the 2023 water rate study and proposed rate structure, which is ongoing work. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, I'm here this evening to present this item, and I have our consultant, Ralph Tellis, is on the line. Kevin Kostuk is available to present as well. But um, I just wanted to kind of introduce the memo real quick. As you said, it has been an ongoing process. We've been working on this since about the March-April timeframe. 
we have brought you some information on the um, finance report and the recommendations that came out of that. We're also then this evening bringing you um, some, op some options on rate structure for you to consider. Um, I would like to thank everyone that has participated to date in this effort. Our Water Rates Advisory Committee members have been invaluable in providing insight, as has uh, various staff members. This is never something that we love to do. This is not an easy process, and we take no enjoyment out of having to consider raising rates for our customers. We realize that things are difficult all over. Inflation is hitting everyone hard. The economy has been challenging for most households. We're not exempt from those inflationary pressures, but we do sympathize um, with customers that are struggling right now. We do um, have some options to present to you this evening. Most of the costs that we're discussing amount to about an increase of a dollar a day per household on roughly. So for a three-person household, you're talking about 33 cents per person per day um, for fresh, clean drinking water um, and a sustainable basin. So that's not um, something to disregard at all. So this evening, I'd like to go ahead and um, present yeah, present Melanie. Uh, she's going to introduce the um, uh, rate presentation, and then she'll pass it off to Kevin, and he'll get into some of the details of the rate structure. Good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Melanie Mouse Schumacher, and as many of you know, Leslie Strom. Um, we both work for SoCal Creek Water District. I'm the Special Projects Communications Manager, and Leslie is the Finance and Business Manager. And then, as Leslie mentioned, we're also joined tonight by Kevin Kostwick with Raftelis. And so I have a couple of slides that I want to do, at least do some introductions related to the district. Um, as, so we'll go ahead and do the introductions, the district's mission and our water supply challenges. Then Kevin is going to take the majority of the evening's presentations to discuss the water rate study, the financial plan review, the rate alternatives, the bill impact. Um, as Leslie mentioned, we have a water rates advisory committee who has provided input, and then, of course, information on the public. And I'm going to pause. Yeah, we're pausing because I believe it's a blank screen. Are you seeing it out there? You are? Okay. We're seeing it in presentation mode. So. Thanks for your patience. Now it's full screen. You can see it well, Dr. Jaffe? Yes, before it was, right now it's, it's uh, we're seeing all the slides queued up on the left side and then the slide that we're, that's the current slide is bigger. Now okay. it, tell it us just changed it, back. Tell us when it looks right. There's a little Smush lag. that maybe? There's a lag. There's a lag, so leave it up. He had it. Oh, there's a lag. Thank you. Now it's good. That one's not working. Okay, that's good. Do you guys see it in presentation mode or just the main slide? Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and again, thank you for allowing me to speak a little bit, Ron, on the project. Um, I am a longtime employee of SoCal Creek Water District. I'm also a resident here. I've raised two boys here um, and have 
have had a family here. So this community is very important to me. Um, just a little bit about Soquel Creek Water District. Um, we are a not-for-profit water agency that provides water to the communities of the part of the incorporated area of Capitola and then the unincorporated areas of Aptos, La Selva Beach, Rio de Mar, Seacliff, and again, Soquel. We have about 40,000 residents that we provide water through about 16,000 connections. And as you can see from this illustration here, which is this infographic, a lot of infrastructure goes into having a reliable water a supply that can provide water to our customers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That not only provides water to our customers and businesses that are here within our region, but we also provide water for fire protection and other daily needs. I need to change this. Hold on, just go like this. I think it's showing differently on different screens. So, Melanie, is it possible to take the presentation down, correct it for television, so that they don't have a split screen? Maybe take us offline while while that happens. Well, do it like for. Don't know how to do that. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> that looks like the Twilight Zone. Sorry about that, everybody. Can you see it, Tom? Can you see it, Tom? I could show it like that. What do you think of that? But it has this, like, top bar. Oh, you know what? Go like that. How's that? That readable out on the uh, right now it's not showing, but it was readable. I think Emma's gonna share. That is readable.
that's good to know. What is that? Can you see the? Is there anything on the screens now? Yes. Let's see the main slide, and then I see the six, seven other slides, but much smaller. And I see the menu. The now I don't see the menu, but it's all readable. I think you should just proceed. Are you able to advance when I just say advance? Does that sound good? Okay. Okay, I think we're up and running. Thank you guys for your patience. I think the next slide we wanted to just address and take some time again. I think we've mentioned it earlier in the meeting today, but Really, it's the kind of the challenges and the why of what the district is doing, along with our regional partners here in the Santa Cruz County, Mid-County region. The water supply here um, is locally sourced. We don't receive any state or imported water here, like many other areas in California. Groundwater is our only source of water for SoCal Creek Water District, as well as other pumpers in this Mid-County area. Unfortunately, the groundwater has um, not been replenished by natural rainfall in a sustainable way. And because more rainfall, I mean, sorry, more water has been pumped than can be naturally replenished by rainfall, this has led to a condition called seawater intrusion. Um, the basin was designated in California in 2014 as critically overdrafted as well as a high priority. And those two designations are because, one, there's seawater intrusion present and the high priority because we don't have any other water supply. Um, the state of California mandated that our basin be brought back into sustainability by 2040. There are over 500 basins in California, and our basin is one of 21 basins identified as overdrafted and mandated to be brought back into sustainability by 2040. That's really our primary why. As you can see on the image on the top right, that is seawater intrusion that was detected from the technology that California is doing currently of measuring and identifying where seawater is occurring along our coastline. We've got it. We knew that we were having it on both ends of the district. And with the SkyTem technology, which is an aerial just geophysical mapping tool, it located that that contamination was all along our entire coastline. As you can see on the bottom right, which is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the red illustrates seawater intrusion. So we have seawater intrusion occurring all along the entire bay. In addition to the seawater intrusion challenges, we also must meet and um, are required to ensure that we can meet the water quality standards set forth by California. And as mentioned earlier, there are stricter water quality standards being set forth for chromium-6 and other qu water quality parameters. And then, of course, um, climate change impacts. As we've seen lately with the recent droughts and atmospheric rivers, um, and knowing that with climate changes will have impacts related to reduced groundwater supply, um, what happens in these instances is there's more intense rainfall but that rainfall does not mean that that water would go into our groundwater basin. Why not? 
I'm, I'm not supposed to take <laughs> feedback, so we'll address that later, sorry. Oh, Emma, I'm trying to advance it. It wasn't working, sorry. I have to. So with these challenges back in the early 2000s, um, the district was pursuing desalination as a supplemental water supply with the city of Santa Cruz. In 2013, um, the, de the desalination project did not go forward, and that left our district in a place where we needed I'm losing technology. Um, the district needed to do uh, something in terms of the R solutions. And so in 2013, there was a very public process of getting input from our community. And what came out of that was a really a long-term, multifaceted community water plan that was developed with our community for our community. And there are three primary tenants. First and foremost, it's conservation and using water efficiently and wisely. The second one was adaptive groundwater management, moving our wells that were located close to the coast and more inland just to help reduce uh, the pumping right there uh, where the seawater intrusion was occurring. And then, of course, it was development of new water supplies. With groundwater as our only source, our water supply was not diversified and was not resilient. And so the board identified that those were the three primary things that we could do to bring our basin into sustainability. As we went forward with that in our community water plan, we also wanted to focus on what was most important to our community members. And so there were three primary values that came out of that was one, ensuring high quality water. Two, to do something timely, knowing that we had the state mandate that we had to meet. And three, they wanted to ensure year round reliability, reliability and resiliency. Next slide. So since um, 2013 and 2015, when we were looking at our new water supplies, recycled water came to the forefront as the major water supply project to develop as part of the community water plan. And that's the project that we've been doing over the last eight years. Um, one of the things with in looking at the water supply, not only was it of high quality, it could be timely, could we um, assist with getting grant funding was also looking at the value of it from the economic standpoint. And so we had a um, commissioned a study by UCSC professor, Dr. Brent Haddad, and he did an economic impact analysis for us. And the take home message of this study was twofold. One, the water reliability here in our region really provides almost a billion dollars in economic benefit in terms of residential, businesses, and the environmental. And I think the take home message related to what's important here tonight was really about what happens to our water rates if we don't have a reliable water supply. And without a water supply here in our region, the studies concluded that our water rates would go up threefold. And so without water, not only would our cost be higher, but it would also mean that our customers had to use less. Next slide. And then, of course, I know we mentioned it earlier in terms of our community water plan, but the district does prioritize and value always seeking input from our community. We're not, you know, a really large um, ut utility agency. We're not a private utility. We are comprised of residents here who make up our board, staff, and uh, employees that work every day to provide water to our customers. So we're actively seeking feedback. In 2020, we conducted a phone survey um, that sought input related to what was important. And you can see here, nine out of 10 of uh, our customers in this statistically valid survey wanted to ensure that we were investing in our infrastructure. Nine out of 10 also wanted us to take na action now, knowing that we had that mandate with the state to bring our basin into sustainability. And then we were very interested in knowing what the comfort level and acceptability was in terms of Pure Water SoCal as a recycled water project. 
and three out of four of our customers are comfortable with that. I'd like to attribute a lot of that to the outreach and education um, of our community base and trying to understand really uh, why is a project needed first, which is because of the seawater intrusion, and then also understanding what is Pure Water SoCal, what is the technology. Yes, it is like desalination as mentioned earlier, but it requires a lot less energy, about a quarter less energy, and sometimes even half because the salt um, in ocean water is what needs to be taken out of um, the desalination process. Here, the salt contact in, in wastewater is not as high. Um, but we also wanted to understand, like, is this a new technology? No, we learned and we went around and we communicated that agencies such as Orange County Water District have been doing purified recycled water for groundwater replenishment since the 1970s. And so to have that deeper appreciation of who's done this before, who we can look to, Director Balboni, you had mentioned that agencies are looking at us. We looked at those ahead of us, and we continue to look at them to ensure that we are building a project with best management practices. Um, similarly, like with our community recently with the Water Harvest Festival, we had samples of uh, the water from Orange County Water District so that people could taste it. And we also did it with um, made kombucha so that people could be could relate to that water. One thing to note is that the Water Harvest Festival was sponsored. And so there wasn't any uh, ratepayer money for bands and face painting. I knew that was a question. So I just at least wanted to clarify that. that those were sponsored by community groups so that it was not part of our rate payers. Um, I just clarifying that. Yeah, no problem. And then um, really I think we continue to always want to seek input from our community and we continue to do so, which is a sentiment to why we have the Water Rates Advisory Committee. And I'm happy to answer more questions on this later, but I, we did want to turn it to Kevin, who is going to speak next on the water rate study. Thank you, Melanie. Good evening, President Christensen, directors and members of the public in attendance tonight. We can go to the next slide. Uh, my name is Kevin Kostick from Raptelis. Uh, I joined you last, last month uh, and also was involved in the prior rate study. Uh, we'll start with a refresher slide. We talked about this last meeting as well, a rate study process. Um, this is our, gen our generic framework for conducting a rate study. So we start with a framework of financial goals and policies, pricing objectives, and identifying any alternative rate structures that we want to evaluate. The second step is building out a long-term financial plan. We discussed that at some depth last meeting uh, in October, and we'll, we'll touch on that again tonight. The third step is working through cost of service analyses, uh, conducting cost allocations between different user groups and evaluating alternative rates calculating those rates and calculating customer impacts. We're just past that step three. We're gonna be talking uh, at length on step three tonight. And then the back portion of this rate study process is really determined by our legal framework here in California. So the rate adoption process of documenting the study, basically translating our mathematics and our Excel-based model into a, a, a Word document um, to support the, the study and the underlying rates. That report is made publicly available and reviewed by legal counsel. And then the last step of the rate study is rate adoption. So we have to notice all of our customers. We have to conduct a public hearing after a minimum protest period, uh, at which then the board can adopt uh, rates. And throughout that process, as Melanie mentioned, as you're going to see further on in the presentation, we engage the community throughout that process. Next. Also, as mentioned, we worked uh, through a, weight, a water rates advisory committee this cycle. Uh, this is an ad hoc committee that was formed in April of this year. Uh, it's comprised of 10 customers and two board members, all of which are ratepayers to the district. And their charge is to uh, receive input uh, or provide input and recommendations rather as part of the rate study. And if we go to the next slide, we'll detail all of the uh, all the details we work through with this committee. The first, uh, and this is our first involvement, Raftelis in August 
on the 14th. We had a rate study discussion talking about the prior rate study, the 218 process, talking about community values, uh, and talking about communication strategies to customers. We came back in late September and we uh, talked about financial planning as an overview, talking about the inputs and then the underlying assumptions that go into projecting revenues and expenses and looking at different options or scenarios. We came back to the committee on October 12th, uh, talking about cost of service conceptually, how rates are designed, what uh, alternatives might look like conceptually. And then we returned at the end of October with uh, rate alternatives. These are revenue neutral to compare the current rate structure with any alternatives and looking at those preliminary bill impact analyses and looking at pros and cons of different rate structures. And then finally, uh, last Monday, we met with the committee for the final time and we looked at those refined alternatives, including proposed revenue increases and comparing again, bill impacts and receiving their feedback, uh, some of which you'll see here tonight. So I just wanted to uh, convey that working through a committee is no small task. There's a, a lot of effort that goes into it, both for the committee members and for the staff. This is something that is not terribly common in California, though it's, it's becoming increasingly common um, as we work through these rate studies with uh, community members and with rate payers themselves. So uh, kudos to the district and the committee members for uh, sticking with such detailed information along the way. So let's turn to the long range financial plan. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll just recap uh, what are our drivers when we look at a long range financial plan. And these are kind of the key items that underpin a utility's cost of service and our projections on uh, cash needs, so revenues and expenses. So inflationary pressures, which uh, Leslie mentioned at the top before we even got into the presentation that a utility is no different uh, than the rest of us in household budgets and inflationary pressure. We have pressure on sources of supplies, both traditional groundwater availability and future pure water sources. Uh, cash reserves are important for mitigating risk. We have uh, board adopted reserve policies as far as cash and debt. Future borrowing terms and assumptions, so those come into play uh, for the pure water SoCal project and future repayments of loans, net of grants. Baseline water sales estimates. So we know there's been downward pressure on uh, water sales and, and a new baseline level of demand. And then capital reinvestment that kind of covers many of these things. Capital reinvestment on infrastructure that tends to be out of sight and out of mind that can be in hard to reach places that might rely on specialized services, uh, specialized equipment and specialized components. So those all go into uh, projecting our expenses and comparing them against our rate revenues from customers. And if we go to the next slide, these are the examples or the options uh, that we brought to you last month. Uh, the first example uh, had the lowest revenue increases year over year, but what that did was leave ourselves open to a bit more financial risk in pressure on debt service coverage and on cash reserves. The second example here provided a one-time significant increase in the first year of rates and then moderating thereafter. Uh, but again, that would compound impacts to customers, uh, particularly if there's a change in rate structure, depending on the rate structure itself. So the, and I'm gonna go to the far right here. Example four uh, provided a financial look to say what if our uh, future demand expectations from water sales increase from our, our assumptions of about 2,600 acre feet per year back to about 2,900 acre feet per year. And we, went, we don't wanna go there similarly for the financial risk that uh, might, it might entail. So example three is what we're going to uh, show tonight as far as the rates that you'll see and the associated impacts. And we did wanna pick that middle ground just to demonstrate the rates tonight, mindful that no decision by the, the board has been made. So everything you see uh, in tonight's presentation will include a 12% increase in that first year. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see how the longer term plans out. So again, we're calling this the middle ground because what it does is it uh, it's not the lowest increases over the short term uh, because of financial risk and it's not the largest increase in year one to minimize rate impacts. So the middle ground option again is 12% each year 
uh, for planning purposes out the first five years, mindful that we're only uh, going for a four year rate adoption. So five years of 12%, and then what you see thereafter is five and a half percent. So kind of two segmented um, uh, steps in rate increases that would be proposed. And what that allows us to do is in the top left chart, uh, our blue line, that's our calculated debt service coverage, we're well above minimums and above our policy targets, so we feel good about that. And from a cash standpoint, which is the bottom left, the total funds balance chart, you'll note that even in this scenario, we're under that target. Uh, we bought them out in fiscal year 2026, around about 9 million, when we'd rather be at about 16 million. But we recover by uh, year five to be at or just slightly above our uh, reserve policy. Next slide, please. And we can probably just skip two. So let's get to our rate design alternatives. And the first thing we want to remind uh, everyone in attendance yeah, is that the district does have uh, guiding principles. These are our key objectives as we sometimes refer to them in rate setting. Uh, and the, yes. I, I just wanted to ask a question before you went on to the options. Um, even if like rates were approved at 12% and that's what it was decided on the first year, um, if, if, you know, water use went up or other factors were the case, you know, we can make a choice to have lower rates at any one of those following years, correct? That's correct. So any, okay. any rates that are adopted, uh, you can think of as the maximum that you may implement in future years. So noticing and adopting those rates for 218, Proposition 218 rather, uh, sets a maximum that you can charge. Now, some agencies do go through a proper uh, financial plan update annually and say, well, where are we relative to where we thought we would be? Is it financially prudent to implement something less than what was noticed and adopted or not? And I just want to make sure I understand. We're talking about 12% revenue increase, which doesn't equate to 12% rate increase, except correct. off the average. That's so correct. We can, you know, divide that 12% or parse that 12% in different ways. And also our customers always have the option of using less water for their, for their bill to be less. Yes, and thank you for that distinction. So when we say 12%, we're talking about the rev the overall revenue needs uh, of the utility or how much revenue needs to come from rates relative to the current rates. Um, but it's then in the cost of service and the rate design uh, stages where we apportion that additional 12%. So there's some, there's some distinguishing between the 12% and the revenue needs in the first year and in the resulting rates. In years two, three, and four, all rates would increase by 12%. It's only in the first year where we're reallocating costs and perhaps restructuring rates that that 12% is uh, on average. Okay, uh, so as uh, part of uh, the rate study um, and earlier in the year, the district board reiterated their guiding principles and you see them here. And we want to acknowledge these guiding principles because they help us uh, with defining what types of alternatives uh, that we wish to uh, evaluate as far as rate structures uh, and folding these values into our rates and charges themselves. So legal defensibility is paramount. Uh, we want prudent, transparent development of water rates to comply with all applicable laws and regulations. Financial sustainability so the district's ability to meet obligations from its own revenues, fees, and any other income sources. And then social equitability, uh, which we've uh, translated into fairness in rates between customers, current customers, and between current and future users of the water system. So with those guiding principles in line, if we can go to the next slide. We have evaluated four different options uh, as far as the water use rates. And we've worked through uh, these alternatives, both with staff, with legal, and in several meetings with the, the Water Rates Advisory Committee. So the four alternatives, uh, first being a uniform rate structure, 
So that would apply one water use rate to all use and all classes. So we, now, we no longer have tiers for residential, but we also don't have classes uh, between residential, commercial, and irrigation. So a uniform rate structure for all. The second alternative is the existing uh, two-tier rate structure. So it's simply an update to the residential rate structure that we have, which is two-tier, and then we have uh, a use rate for our commercial and irrigation accounts. The third alternative is just a different flavor of the two-tier, if you will, where we're allocating and recovering costs in a different manner, which results in different rates for a residential two-tier structure. And then the three-tier structure is our last, and that is simply uh, uh, evaluating an intermediate tier uh, between the two-tier option and a three-tier option. So all alternatives here target approximately 50% of our revenue uh, or cost recovery from fixed charges. So that would be an increase overall. Uh, that's after discussion with both staff and the advisory committee and keeping in mind the board's uh, key objective of financial sustainability. And then last but not least, as I've already mentioned, all rates shown here do include uh, the 12% uh, revenue increase in year one. We go to the next slide. So before we get into the, the exact options, uh, one of the distinguishing features in the rate alternatives is when it comes to basin sustainability and recovering those costs through our rate design. So in the existing approach that we uh, worked through about four years ago now, all of our basin sustainability costs for the residential class are recovered entirely from tier two, from water reliability or conservation. And that's, that's true for the residential class. Co commercial and irrigation uh, accounts recover those costs across all units of water since it's a uniform rate. But the key there is that in the residential uh, tiered rate, all of our basin uh, sustainability planning costs at the time are recovered from tier two only. In an alternative methodology, which you'll see in two of these options, we distinguish basin sustainability in two pieces. One is additional supply that's required for high water users for demands greater than what the basin's sustainable yield is. And then the other component, the residual, is the basin-wide benefit that benefits all water users, all parcels over the basin, actually, whether they're water users uh, or using water or not, to have that future water availability and as a barrier for seawater intrusion. Next slide. Um, I think we maybe missed a slide here. Um, hmm. Well, our uniform, our uniform option, uh, missed, it didn't make the cut, but it will show up in the impacts. And so what we'll do, we'll start at the existing two tier. Uh, if I remember correctly, the uniform option, the proposed rate was $13.85. Uh, that would be under this proposed rate column header with the gray fill. Uh, that would be true for all users. Again, residential, commercial, and the irrigation would all pay the same water use rate. Uh, the second, this is the second option we're showing you now, which is an update uh, to the two-tier volumetric. Next slide. Resident. And and Kevin, I believe the one you said is missing is the next slide, the uniform. There you oh, go. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. They must have gotten flipped. So we'll start. We'll start. Well, we might as well start here, and we can go back one. <laughs> so the uniform rate here. Uh, hey, I got the price. The price of the the rate correct. Great. $13.85, and we get there with four components. So we have our supply component, that's for producing groundwater. Delivery, that's for meeting average daily demand conditions, so how our, uh, how our users use water in average conditions. Peaking, which is how users use water in the peak period of their demand relative to their average demand. And then conservation costs for conservation outreach and rebate programs, et cetera, that's recovered. And what you'll notice here is in all those components, they're the same rate because we have a uniform rate that is true for all classes and all tiers. So we end up with a rate of $13.85. The key here is to see the impacts to the, the classes and the tiers uh, when compared to their current rate. So a uniform rate would have uh, 
a sizable impact to tier one residential, an increase of $4.75 compared to the current rate of $9.10. Conversely, tier two residential water would come down. Again, because right now that price differential is, uh, is majority based on basin sustainability costs being recovered with tier two. And then commercial and irrigation would come down modestly. So they basically get the benefit of smoothing the rest of the water use uh, demands into the rate. So if we can go back up one to our second alternative, thank you. So the existing two tier again is an update to, to our current rate structure. A two tier residential with the first tier uh, of use up to 5.99 units per month and then tier two for all use at six units and greater. So here we have a supply cost of $4.33, average daily demand cost of $5.60, no peaking in our current rate structure, all peaking extra capacity costs are recovered through meters charges. And then our conservation costs are based on uh, reliability. Again, tier two only for residential, $28.50, and then uniformly recovered for commercial and irrigation. So in our existing, uh, we see a modest increase to tier one, 83 cents per unit is the, the increase relative to the current rate. And then tier two comes down uh, more modestly when compared to the, the other alternatives, $2.80. And then commercial and irrigation uh, still comes down, uh, but just a bit over a dollar. And those come down because we are recovering more, a greater share of our revenues from fixed charges. So as the share overall to fixed charges go up, the share overall to these water use rates comes down. We can go to the next, we'll be on our uh, third option here, revised. So this is uh, the same two tier residential structure, zero up to 5.99 uh, units per month and then greater than six. But here we're apportioning those basin sustainability costs through our supply bucket. And so you'll see a supply differential there, $4.55 for the first tier, $8.17 for the second tier. So again, what we're doing, the mechanics and the cost of service analysis is taking the share that's for high volume use and apportioning that to supply as we step through the residential classes use. And then the share that's for basin sustainability is going over to the fixed meter charge. So again, here on the revised two tier, we sum up all of our components and the result is, uh, an increase of $3.44 on residential tier one. Uh, tier two would come down just over $23. And then commercial and irrigation in this uh, alternative go up just a bit because now we've uh, again introduced an alternative recovery of our basin sustainability costs as well as introduced that peaking category. Uh, next slide, please. And last, the fourth option is a three tier. Now in the three tier, this looks a lot like the last one with uh, the caveat that we now have an intermediate tier where we've ratcheted down tier one from zero up to 3.99 units per month. We now have a second tier of four to 7.99 and then all use greater at eight units or greater would be in tier three. Commercial and irrigation are gonna stay the same because in this alternative, uh, two to three only affects the residential class, so we'll focus there. Tier one goes up uh, $3.40. Tier two, we have an intermediate tier, so when comparing to the existing rate structure, you have to compare a couple units that would still be in tier one and a couple units that would still be in tier two, but the gist is those first couple that would have stayed in tier one go up $5.48. The ones that would be in the existing tier two come down about $26.65. So if we can go to the next slide, we can uh, do the comparison here. So this is a comparing the, the rates for residential water use uh, across the, the two or three tiers, and then comparing the current rates with the four alternatives. So the current being shown first, $9.10, tier two, 4123, and then all uh, alternatives relative to that. So the uniform again would be 1385 for all units. The existing two tier remains fairly close to the current rate structure uh, between the, the rates charged in tier one and tier two. Uh, and then in the revisions, the revised two tier and the three tier option, tier one comes down, tier two, excuse me, tier one goes up, tier two comes down, and then we have a, a third tier uh, for the three tier option that would still be 
uh, a substantial decrease when compared to the existing uh, uppermost rate for residential water use. Next slide. So that's all the water use rates, but we do have the second, we have the other side of a customer's bill, which are the fixed charges. And we have uh, we have fixed charges that vary by meter size, but also by class. We've grouped, we group com commercial and residential meters uh, into the same class. The current charge I'm gonna focus on is the five eighths inch meter, $52.34. That's where most of our single family residential customers uh, connections are, and that's also uh, the most common meter size for commercial users. So the proposed, uh, uh, the existing two tier, I'm gonna focus on that one. Uh, that one recovers slightly less from our fixed charges. And so it has a lower rate, but then in, in all the other proposed uh, alternatives, uh, those would be the same rate. So again, no change between the water use alternatives there, simply between the water use rates themselves for those alternatives. So that's the other half of the customer bill. And then if we continue on, we'll get into bill impacts. Next slide. So all these, uh, the, the next series of slides will be focused on residential bills and, and really what we mean is single family residential because these all assume a, a five eighths inch meter connection. And we're showing the monthly bill impact between a usage level of two units per month up to 12. And towards the bottom of the table, what we're, what we're trying to help with is um, to, to relay how many customers fall within this range. And so for the two HCF, that's 100 cubic feet or 748 gallons of water. At the two HCF mark, we have about 31 of our, 31% of all of our single family residential customers fall in that zero, one or two, unit per month range. Then when we step up to five units per month, now we're capturing another 41% of our customers or 72% of all single family. And we step through that again and again, just to impress upon you that the majority of our water users, nearly 90% in the single family class use seven units of water per month or less. When we get up to the nine unit mark, we're now capturing about 95% of all single family bills. So what the, the table itself is showing is the impact of a proposed rate structure relative to the current. So, and this is in monthly terms. So I'm gonna focus on the five HCF here. Uh, the uniform uh, alternative would have an impact to that user of $36.67, whereas an existing, keeping the, the existing two tier rate structure, causes an impact of $15.32. The revised two tier, $30.12, and the three tier, $32.02. And so we step through that for each uh, of these levels of use. And what you can see is with the alternatives, the existing two tier mitigates the impacts more so than the others. Uh, another takeaway is that our impacts are higher to lower volume users than to higher volume users. And that's a function of the rate design. And again, that most of our customers uh, in the class fall around the four to five unit mark. Next slide. So we wanted to relate this uh, just a, a different, uh, in a different fashion here, which is to take that impact that you saw in the prior slide and relate it into uh, a cost per dollar per day. So our current bill for a single family user with a five eighths inch connection using five units a month, that current bill is just shy of $98. When we translate that monthly impact from the prior slide at five units, you can see the impacts in a dollar per day term. So the existing two tier, 51 cents. Next would be the revised two tier at a dollar per day, three tier at a dollar seven and uniform rate at a dollar 22. Now it's important to notice that in year one, the impact is in fact highest, and that's a function of a few things. The increase in the financial needs, the 12%, the reapportionment of costs and how we recover base and sustainability, the structural changes between the different alternatives and all the other underlying cost allocations uh, as part of a cost of service analysis. 
Then in years two, three, and four, you see the impacts are much more uniform because in those years, the rates are simply increased by uh, the revenue need. So uh, that would be like saying 12% in year two would affect all rates equally at 12%. So that's the dollar per day impact at 5-HCF. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see it for the high end, which is at nine, we picked 9-HCF to capture uh, kind of that upper, nine, or get to 95% of all of our customers. So a nine unit per month bill is currently just shy of $231. For this customer, that savings, and it would be a savings in year one, is between about 26 cents with the existing structure and a maximum of $1.33 per day with a three tier. Then in subsequent years, they experience an increase uh, similar to the five unit, where now those impacts are normalized based on an increase of 12% per year. Next. So we wanted to qualitatively evaluate how these uh, alternatives stack up, what are the pros and cons, uh, relative to one another and with all of the board's policy objectives in mind. And I won't, I won't read, I promise I won't read through all of these bullets and we have worked through this with the advisory committee as well. Uh, just to say that there are benefits and there are, are challenges to all of these alternatives. There's no silver bullet. There's no one size fits all rate structure. Um, and so there are benefits and challenges uh, to all of these. And if we go to the next slide, we have a similar uh, a similar uh, table, but a bit more simplified. And this simply relates our four alternatives and our three policy objectives, social equitability, financial sustainability, and legal defensibility. And I'll be the first to admit there's a bit of subjectivity in here. Why you might score one, three versus four, or should we have three and a half check marks instead? But broadly, what we wanted to convey is that on the social equitability front, uh, we think the uniform charge score is the poorest, the three tier, uh, arguably the highest. For, sustain for financial sustainability, uh, the revised two tier or the three tier are gonna perform a bit better than the uniform or the current two tier where we might have more revenue risk. And then from a legal dispensability front, we gave them all five check marks because as I've mentioned previously in the presentation, this effort uh, has been hand in hand with legal counsel. Uh, we wouldn't work through anything with staff or with the advisory committee or with the board that we didn't feel was legally defensible. Next. We also wanted to provide uh, some of the key takeaways that we received from the advisory committee. Uh, and this would have been uh, a week ago, Monday. And what there was consensus around. So there was consensus around increasing fixed revenue recovery to achieve or better achieve the financial sustain, this financial sustainability goal of the board and reduce financial risk. Uh, the uniform option was not recommended by the advisory committee. There was overall a preference for a revised two tier or a three tier option. And uh, there was a further comment to evaluate a, a possible modification to the three-tier option to where we could uh, increase, perhaps modestly, the conservation price signal in tier three. And what that would do is it would lower the price in, uh, in tier two. Next slide. Uh, we've got a few more uh, service rates and service charges to go through. So we've talked about water use rates. We've talked about our fixed uh, meter-based charges. We also have private fire line service customers. Uh, here we're showing our fire service customers by the fire line diameter. So one inch up through eight inch, and then also showing the count of those fire lines, uh, just so we can all see where most of our customers are. They're mostly at the two inch meter. And then our proposed and current charges. Uh, so for the two inch customer, uh, where we have most of our Fire lines, a proposed charge of $15.77 versus the current $10.43, a, a monthly impact of $5.34. Again, mindful that this includes the 12% overall increase. Next. Uh, and then water shortage emergency rates. Uh, we, we don't have rates to show tonight because it's a function of the selected rate structure. Um, but we did want to uh, acknowledge that we are updating the water shortage emergency rates. 
These again are supplemental surcharges to normal condition rates. They're temporary in nature. They are still rates in the context of Proposition 218. And so we have to adopt them. They have to be part of our study and they have to be noticed and adopted, same as any other rate. Uh, these are, because they're temporary, uh, they can be implemented and rescinded by the board at its discretion. And the board uh, can use a different tool uh, if it so chooses or implement drought rates that are lower than what were noticed. Next slide. And so the water shortage emergency rates, when we do come back to you, once we have a, uh, once we have direction on a base water use rate structure, we will update and come back with those proposed water shortage emergency rates. The proposal is to maintain the same methodology, which is a percentage increase to our water use rates at each stage. Uh, we'll simply update that methodology based on our updated costs, any changes to the rate structure. Uh, and then just so we all know uh, what our stages are and what the basis of the drought shortage rates would be. Uh, we have five stages, we in fact have six stages, but stage six is open-ended. So we would be adopting stages one up through stage five, where we're targeting uh, demand reduction in those stages of 5% up to 50%. So that would be the basis uh, for calculating our emergency rates. And with that, I am going to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Gina DePinto. Thank you, Kevin. So if we could move to the next slide. I just have a couple few brief slides. Just so everyone knows, there is public information available. We wanna make sure that all the customers and consumers of water in, in the district service area have access to information. And so there is a special website. You can see the address there at SoCalCreekWater.org slash rate study, uh, where we have located frequently asked questions. There are two videos in particular that are really worth watching. The first one, you can see the screenshot. It's only two minutes. It's very quick. It's um, easy to watch and basically a, a much longer, more detailed one, but basically it is just to let consumers know and the customers know that as Kevin just went through, rates are not arbitrarily set. They are not picked out of thin air. These videos give a real good overview of how rates are set in California. We happen to be very different from most other states in the country, and we do have laws that must be followed. Um, other things that will be on the website, other materials, certainly meetings and event schedules. So if, to stay connected to the process, we have a calendar there and also links to the different meetings, um, presentations. Uh, I'll be touching on it. We could probably move to the next slide, but we held a webinar last week. And so if you weren't able to attend or were curious also, in addition to the other informational videos, we have a video of the webinar. Here's some of the information that the district staff has been issuing for customers. Um, the first, of course, is the advisory committee. And so, I, re I reference that in the outreach because very few water districts um, actually have an advisory committee. So this is your peers. These are customers who are engaged. And again, these are not decisions that are being made in a back room. And all of them would be probably willing to address um, the community, speak at, at the board meetings or what have you about their experience. You can also see that the district issued information in the Quick Sips eBlast. Hopefully everyone has signed up for that. There was an article in the September issue, as well as the October issue. Uh, I've mentioned the videos. The district also promoted and held, um, hosted a table at the farmer's market. And I mentioned the, rep the webinar, which was last week. And also a new issue will be coming up soon of what's on tap. So um, information is, is in the quarterly newsletter as well. And as we move to the next schedule, we're gonna put up the meeting schedule for you. You can see some of the public meetings that have been held, including the webinar and of course board meetings. And here we are at November 20th. And so depending on the board's actions this evening, we've got December 5th held in case more information needs to come back to the board. Um, otherwise we're definitely scheduled for December 19th. And then as we move th through this process, and as the board does um, recommend or adopt moving to proposed rates, 
part of the legal process is issuing the Proposition 218 notice, which is a minimum of 45 days before a public hearing. And so those dates are coming up. And so what we are planning to do is in between the Prop 218 arriving in everyone's mailbox and between the hearing, we're going to hold an open house that ad addresses the information in the Prop 218 to actually discuss and, and answer your questions, everyone's questions on the proposed rates that actually are being put forward. Um, so we, as we, as we lock in these dates, of course, keep an eye on the website because we will be updating that information. We don't have those dates as of yet. And next up, I'm actually handing it back to Leslie who will go through the possible board actions this evening. So thank you. At the end of the memo, um, we have some motions for the board to consider. Uh, the first one is to uh, direct staff to proceed with calculating these rate alternatives based on that scenario in the finance plan of the 12% annual revenue increases. Um, if that's the board's decision to go ahead with that, then that would help us kind of uh, lock in what we're going to do then on rates. Um, another motion would be to provide staff with direction regarding the proposed rate structures that you've seen here tonight and to bring back the uh, draft rate report to the December 19th meeting, or you could direct us to return to the board meeting December 5th um, with some new rate structure proposals if there's any changes that you wanna make to what was brought to you tonight, or again, to take no action. So that concludes the presentation. If the board president would like to open up to public comment or discuss. This is, this is, does any, does anybody have any questions? Okay. I have a question for Kevin, I suppose. Um, one of my concerns, you know, of the current rate structure was how um, the difference between, you know, small and large families and, and, um, trying to have it be as fair as possible. And with that goal in mind, I'm just in looking at what you presented. It seems like it evens it out a little more across all customers with less of a huge jump for those with larger families with either of the two potentially recommended one, the revised structured um, two tier or three tier. And I just want to see if I'm correct in that assumption. Yes, the, the revised two tier or the three tier uh, is certainly going to take an impact off of those that have a higher level of use. Um, you know, obviously we don't know if a higher level of use is because somebody has a large lot or a large family or whatnot. Um, but in that instance where you might have a larger household size, then certainly those options are gonna, uh, they'll mitigate uh, impacts from the current rate structure if you consistently find yourself using that seventh unit or eighth unit of water. Okay, thank you. So I have a couple comments. Um, first, I'd just love to acknowledge and thank Raf Tellis and the district and the Rate Advisory Committee for their incredible, hard, and comprehensive work. Um, however, what came to me is I'd like to explore having a one-year hiatus on the rates, and I'm thinking it would be so fine if we could explore the idea of selling off a fallow property. I think there are some old properties on San Jose Road and other properties that are um, owned by the district to get three or four million dollars to give us one year of no rate increase and then give the rate payers some breathing room for one year and then come back to this. So that's just an idea I'd love to explore. Um, when looking, secondly, when looking at the proposals, it seems to me that the fixed uh, service charge, which is proposed, it's now at 40%, it's proposed to go up to 50%, and that water use charge recovers costs associated with the capital improvements, supply, base delivery, peak demands, and conservation. 
It seems to me I'd, I'd just like to see um, a, an idea of looking at the fixed rate increase be 60%. That seems to me to follow through fairness, legal defensibility, financial sustainability, and social equity. Um, and then third point for me is that I would like to um, definitely see more information on that idea of the third tier with the increase in the third tier. So that, that would decrease the first and second tier. Um, so those are my three comments. Thank you. Question, are we supposed to take a public comment first before um, questions or after? No, I just wanted to <clears throat> make sure the board understood the presentation. Um, no one else has any questions. What about you, Bruce? I've got many, many questions, but I'd like to hear what the public has to say. Okay. And I think typically we do take public comment first and then ask questions. Yeah. Well, that's. I don't think so necessarily. I wanted people to have a, have a board clarify any questions they had about the presentation. Um, if you all are satisfied, then yeah, I, I think that's we, before any action or serious discussion. But I think if there's questions on the presentation, I think that's totally appropriate. Yeah. Anyway, okay, um, I've, I've got quite a few. If if that's how we want to proceed, um, it would help me to go back to slides. Uh, so I don't have the slides in front of me, but. Uh, maybe just one of the slides that shows the breakdown between supply um, and the other factors. Let's do it. For, let's do it for um, the three tier structure, if you could. It's pretty early on. I believe it's slide 24. Okay. This is two tier. There you go. Three tier. Here we go. So, could you explain how these dollar amounts? and exactly what we're talking about for supply, delivery, peaking, and conservation were, were derived. Yes, so, so our supply bucket uh, contains all of our costs around uh, producing our traditional groundwater sources, and then uh, we treat the, the portion of pure water costs that benefit uh, supplemental supply, so for large uh, water users, we treat that as though it's a second source. That is our second source. And so then we differentiate it between the, the tiers. So we look at our customer billing data. We know exactly how much water use uh, is used by all of our customers in aggregate, by each account, uh, by the class in each month. And so when we constrain that water use to just zero to 3.99 units, we say, how much groundwater do we have available? How much demand is there in the residential tier one class? Is there enough to satisfy it, yes or no? And so that becomes our first source, uh, our first uh, rate of supply. Then in tier two, you see that step up because now we exhaust our traditional groundwater in tier two, and we have to blend in some amount of the second source of supply. And then in tier three, we go to entirely uh, supplemental supply from pure water. So that's how we differentiate the supply costs. The delivery costs, again, are based on average. Hey, could I ask some questions on that first? Yeah, yes. Okay. So for pure water uh, Soquel, it's meant to not only provide more water for use, but also to recover the basin. So was there um, some uh, assumptions on the proportionality 
of what's needed to recover the basin versus what's available yeah. for use. Yes, thank you. So 40% of our 40% of total pure water costs are attributed to the large volume water users. And what we do is we step through and say, uh, how much water demand do we have? How much water will come from pure water? So we know those. And then we step through the actual customer customer demands and say, how much water use in aggregate is there over six units per month? Because six six units per connection, which is our current basis for the residential tiers, that represents the the sustainable supply amount of water that any connection can use up to six units per month. So we say, how much water use is there in aggregate above six units a month? And extrapolate that out across the entire customer class and, and excuse me, across the entire district, all customer classes, okay. to that's identify so how much is required to be from supply. And that's 40%. The residual goes to the basin wide benefit. Okay. And delivery is the same. same delivery is the same. Yeah, uh, irregardless. The peaking, yeah. is that, that's based on data yeah. as we, well? Yes, yeah, so, so we step through again, we look at, we have our customer billing data for every account in every period, and we calculate the maximum period of use, the average period of use. We do that for each class and for each tier. And that's where you see that peaking differential that goes, lower to tier one where we have a lot of consistent use then it's highest in tier three where you get the seasonality of irrigation in the summertime and then similarly in commercial you see that it's kind of between the peaking in tier one and tier two residential and then irrigation is highest as we would expect tier three tier three residential peak and irrigation's peak are almost the same which that's kind of a check for us because those are both seasonal demands Okay, and then conservation I'm perplexed on. So how do you assign conservation? So conservation uh, <clears throat> for commercial and irrigation, we apply that across all units of water. And then in the residential class, we recover that only from tiers two and tier three. We basically say that tier one water use is not, that, that use up to four is not what's causing us to uh, incur costs of conservation programs. And so you see that 84 cent uh, rate in tier two and tier three, because what we first do is identify how much conservation do we have in total? How much do we recover from the residential class? And then since we're apportioning it only to tiers two and tier three, that's where you get the 84 cents. Okay, so there was some implicit assumption that residents should play pay for conservation more than commercial and irrigation so it's it's not more it's so if we applied if we applied conservation costs across every unit of water in the residential class that unit rate would be 24 cents just like commercial and irrigation the difference is that unlike commercial and irrigation we are only recovering the residential classes share of conservation costs from water use in tier two and tier three Okay. All right. So that that gives me a better idea. Um, so uh, we might as well just keep this up. So how did you determine the breaks and the tears? Why did so, it was 0.99 and 7.99 a break? So uh, we stepped through uh, a demand analysis. So again, relying on the district's actual customer billing data and identifying logical breakpoints. So I think it's important for everybody to know that Proposition 218 California law does not define how you set tiers, how you identify tier breakpoints, but we want to have a logical method of doing so. And so most common is to either look at demand patterns, efficiency standards, or sometimes a combination of the two. And so it, in the three tier, for example, well, let's let's if I can, we'll go back a few. So your existing your existing two tier is up to five point nine nine, and again, that's based on saying if we take the sustainable yield of the basin of twenty nine hundred acre feet, we divide that across every connection and every month, we have about six units a month 
that a customer could use. So that's our logical breakpoint for existing, and that's the breakpoint for a revised two tier. In the three tier, we said, well, let's see what happens if we inter if we uh, have an intermediate tier. And so tier one, we defined up to 3.99 by looking at your demand patterns. And what we see is the residential, single family residential class in the winter period uses on average about three and a half units a month. So what we commonly do is round up to the nearest whole unit. Now you have uh, you have an approach where you, you, it goes up to the you know, 99 out of 100 and before the, uh, the charge rolls over. So that's basically your winter, your customer's winter demands rounded up to the whole unit, up to four. Similarly with, with tier two, we said, let's look at peak water demands, peak summer, 75th percentile of water use in the class. And that's on the order of 7.3, seven and a half units per month. And again, what we do is we round that up to eight. So those are that's how we define the tiers, but there's also an argument to say it's based on efficiency standards. You could, you know, you could back backwards calculate and say zero to three point nine nine HCF per month is basically the efficient indoor needs of a family of of two, a two person household. And similarly, eight units a month is the efficient indoor needs of of a four person household. Now your customers are more than efficient; they use closer to essential needs. Uh, and your household occupancy or your average household size is on the order of 2.2 .2 to 2.5 people per household. Okay. So I'm, thank you for the explanation, Kevin. You're welcome. Uh, um, so you did bring up the efficient use. Um, so were there any rate structures that just based it on what the an efficient use of water is uh, numbers in no. a report for Santa Cruz County where it's something like 30 35 gallons per person per day Right. Um, I'm trying to think if we. I know we looked, uh, and I might have to lean on Lindsay Roth, who's online as well. We looked at our demand patterns, um, but we also wove in efficiency standards to kind of see where do your customers fall in their actual demand relative to different standards. And so, you know, everything from essential indoor needs down towards about 35, 37 gallons per person per day, up to the current efficiency standard, which is 55 gallons per person per day. And mindful that in your service area, you have some communities, when we look at the census data, that are about 2.2 people per household and up to about 2.5. And so, you know, to, to define it, you know, you have to, so you have to pick, say, are we talking about efficient or essential or something? in between or, or efficient in five years if we go down to 45, which your customers are kind of already there. Um, and then what do you pick as a household size as well? And so, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that is, you know, that's a common approach for defining tier one. Now tier two, we normally get more into the seasonality because tier two often reflects seasonal demands or ir some irrigation needs, um, but certainly your, your efficiency standards and household size come into play in there in defining tier one. Yeah, so it looks like tier one, if you had a the 2.5 or 2.6 average number of people per household, that uh, would be 3,000 divided by 30. So it's about 100 gallons per day for, for tier, tier one use, if I've done my math right. But yeah, let, let's do the math. So 3.99 times 748 uh, divided by uh, 30, 31. 30, yes, thank you, and divide by 2.5. So you're right at 40, 40 GPCD. Okay. And and that's reflective because, so that's, an, that's again a nice check because to say that this four gets you to 40 GPCD, which in most communities would seem un, unattainable but when we look at the average winter use 
of your class, you're there, your customers are there or even slightly below. Okay. Um, I've got more questions. I don't know if other directors wanted to ask questions at this point or whether you want me to continue on. Well, we, a lot of the questions you brought up were brought up at the rate committee, the rate committee meetings. Um, so I, I, that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring this out in front of the, for the public to send these okay. questions. Well, let me just ask one more. If you could, you showed an example with five um, units, what the effects were of the different rate structures. Um, it's a bit later in the presentation, I think, not too much. There we go. Um, so. Do you want the monthly, Dr. Jaffe, or do you want the impact per day? Either one's fine. These are, these are per month, per day. So I, I'm just curious what happens at, say, three. It, is it the same story, basically, that um, the dollar per day impact is very similar for um, year one being highest? and then the subsequent years being lower, and they're not being, except for the existing structure, not being a big difference. That, yes, I'll say that yes, it's true for uh, having the largest impact in year one, and then having similar impacts in years two, three, and four, that will be true at any level of use, because the cost of service and the rate uh, modification only happens this one year. But if we go, if we go back to the prior slide, perhaps um, the impact is going to be it's going to be slightly higher uh, on a daily basis at say two or three units because we're again we're recovering slightly more from fixed charges. We have the addition in the revenue needs twelve percent, and we're now recovering some of our base and sustainability from everyone. And so that kind of compounded effect means you're gonna see a slightly higher increase on the lower end and slightly less as you go up the usage scale. And I may okay. take the uh, opportunity- and then, and then you'll see savings above uh, say seven or eight units per month. I may take and, the opportunity here too, to address um, Director Balboni's comment about going up to 60% fixed. When you increase the fixed charge, the impact to the lower users becomes more prominent. Mm -hmm. And then the, since you have this slide up, uh, Director Balboni also talked about the um, decrease in the higher amounts of water use and explain that to me. It, yeah, so that's a that's again a function of uh, the re, the revisions or the the possible revisions. So the existing maintains things uh, fairly similar to what it is. The uniform, the higher end is going to have savings because now they're just paying the average rate. There's no tier two, and similarly in the revised tier two and the three tier, that highest tier comes down because we're where right now we're recovering all of our base and sustainability costs from tier two. Now gotcha. we're spreading it across both the water use rates and this basin wide benefit across all users. Yeah, no, I, I agree with the logic that uh, everybody uses the water and we need to have a sustainable basin. So everybody should contribute to that. So, all right, well, thanks for answering the questions. You're welcome. I guess I'm, we should open it up to the public now for comment. You have to come to the podium.
Yeah, for you to be recorded, you have to speak into the microphone. <clears throat> I want to make one comment, and I would like to commend your newest member, Ms. Balboni. She is the only one that mentioned something tonight for the reason most of us are here, and that's mitigating the rise. This whole hour was, how can we stick it to them? What's a better way to do it? She mentioned ways of perhaps deferring or saving money. That's what we're really interested in. Thank you. And President Christensen, we're glad to uh, respond to some of these. If you like, at the end of all of them, we can go in between, but I'd recommend let's listen to what they all say. Yeah, Thank you. yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I'm not very good at this, so I actually pre-prepared something tonight, but before I start, I have to admit I'm also frustrated because um, much of what you guys have been saying is that you care about what we have for feedback, and all I've heard is about raising, raising our rates. So... I'm here to express my concerns regarding both the recent and proposed rate increases. I belong to a low-income family of six. My husband is a full-time worker, and I am currently an online student at Arizona State University. Like many other families, we are struggling to get by, given all the recent increases due to inflation. We're conserving as much water as we possibly can, no longer washing our cars at home and doing most of our laundry at outside facilities. Placing our household of six just above what a normal water efficient home of four would typically use based on your company standards and are still paying an average of $230 per month. This has become a huge hardship for our family and we have needed to borrow money at times in order to make our payment. I'm concerned that there are no programs for low income families or elderly customers on fixed incomes. The only offer you have is a once a year forgiveness, but what about the rest of the year? Why are there no programs similar to pg and care program that are designed to provide a reasonable discount in order to make paying for utilities possible for everyone? Have you considered removing the $52.34 service charge for low-income and fixed-income families? Why is there no consideration for the amount of household members in the tier system? It seems far more equitable to allot each member a certain amount of usage before Tier 2 charges begin. It seems unfair to have a household of six beginning Tier 2 at the same rate as a household of one. All this, as this is a municipality, we have no other options other than to comply with this immoral and unethical gouging of customers. I, like every other renter, face eviction if utilities become shut off. If we are unable to keep up with your ever-increasing rates, what do you propose we do? I have recently been made aware of the cost of the Pure Water SoCal program and how, I guess my time is quickly running out. Um, no one has proposed pay cuts, but rather taken raises and retroactive bonuses on jobs that have not yet to be completed. Maybe we should run for a seat ourselves with the amount of money we would be making then. Possibly we might finally be able to pay our water bills. And my name is Nicole Malcolm. <clears throat> and I have some questions about, we've talked a lot about rates and how how we're going to manage this basin, but I haven't heard anything about how we're really going to capture some of the rainfall in the good years rather than letting it just run into the ocean. And I've heard talk of it before, but I don't know if that's been studied or if you're planning on studying that or if there's some viable option in some fashion. Um, I know some of the waterways have to have clean water going through, rainwater uh, going through, but it seems like we've got an awful lot of mountains around here. And uh, I myself have lived in the Bay Area for 68 years. Um, uh, it's unfortunate that we haven't really managed our water or our population need of water. So I'd like to see, you know, levees fixed and I'd like to see more reservoir basins and has anything been done around that? Because I think we have to think outside the box and manage what we get and manage ourselves when we don't have the excess. The other question I have is around, so my second question is with regard to new builds, ADUs, and sprinklers now required in those new builds and what the costs are for those kinds of hookups. 
My third question is whether or not the rates that were presented tonight has actually considered inflation, as as we here we are, and it's not going to stop unless something really changes. So, is that captured also in this study and uh, in the numbers presented? So, those are my questions. This is all on top of a 9% for the last five years, which is about 54% compounded. I don't understand why this district is not cutting back costs. You're giving bonuses to people on projects that aren't even finished yet. Usually bonuses are given at the end of a project if it comes in under budget and before the time. And you guys are giving bonuses retroactive. You're giving raises retroactive. Come on, why on our backs? I sat out in front of Deluxe for two and a half hours a couple of Saturdays ago. So many older people came up and said, I can't take a shower every day. That's sad. They can't plant their garden. They can't have flowers or, or vegetables. That's sad. Are you happy about that? They cannot afford to take a damn shower. It's wrong. As you are making a ton of money, as we're paying benefits for ex-employees at the tune of about $17,000 a month, I don't understand that. We have to run our households within what we get and within reason. And it just, it doesn't, it seems like you guys are being so irresponsible. You're making housing more expensive. Everyone says we need affordable housing. How are these people on fixed income supposed to do it? I'm not, I'm not retired yet, so I'm not on the fixed income. But when it's just unreasonable of you guys to expect people to take after 54% raise to go up another 12% every year. It's, it's unreasonable. You go talk to these senior people that are having a tough time. Not taking a shower every day is unhealthy. It's, it's not good for people's mental. I'm sure you all take showers every day. Thank you. Hello, my name is Becky Steinbrenner, and um, I am very worried for your ratepayers. I've been for a long time. Um, I wish that these slides could have been made public on your website before tonight's presentation. It was a lot of information, and I don't know how you expect people to absorb it in a short time. So please put those up on your website and do so in advance of presentations in the future. Um, the Water Rate Advisory Commissions were also not public. They were before when you did this, but they were not public meetings this time. That would have helped your ratepayers to be able to attend those and uh, just listen in. So my question is, um, what is the cost per unit of the Pure Water SoCal water? That hasn't been explained, and yet it's being factored in as part of the sustainability cost and uh, certainly the debt burden, but we have not heard what the uh, consultant determined is the cost per unit of the Pure Water SoCal source. I'm, I'm really um, disturbed to hear, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that um, the impact will be the highest on the lower uh, water user rate pairs. Well, that really speaks to those ratepayers that uh, Ms. Kirby just talked about that have conserved all they can. They're on fixed income, many of them are seniors, and now they're going to be bearing the brunt of it uh, to uh, be equitable. <laughs> um, I, I really question that um, why you did not even ask the city this past winter when we had a lot of rain, you didn't even ask the city for uh, surface water to put into the aquifer and help out. How will, you, how will this change if direct potable reuse is legal? And um, 
is this really legally defensible under the new case of Pats versus the city of Thank San you, Diego and San Juan Capistrano that was already decided? Thank you. Hi, my name's Tony Crane. Um, First meeting in a while, so I don't feel like I'm totally prepared for this, but um, like property taxes, if you guys consider trying to make it socially equitable for existing users, where somebody, because of the mandatory development that we're being, that's being put upon us, that people who move into the area uh, at this time pay a slightly higher rate um, to keep those people who have been here a long time um, at a lower rate. So, or even as much as I hate to say it, some sort of fee at the time of purchase um, within the district, within our district that would help supplement that. So like a property tax where you're, you're, you're in and it increases just a little bit each year, but those people who then move in actually pay at a higher rate um, based on you know, inflationary things as things go on. Um, has that been considered and is it viable? Thank you. Hello, my name is Anthony. Um, I'm just here to ask to please reconsider increasing rates that we already have a hard enough time to pay. Um, the rates have gone up 9% in each of the year in the last five years, and it's, I just don't understand it. But uh, so basically, um, I, at my household, we have six, and we're using the average of a family of three or four, but still being pushed into the tier two very quickly. And um, so I was just wondering if there's another way we could maybe raise some money through grants, get a grant or raise money through something and take this already heavy financial burden off the customers. Um, also might consider a fixed income or lower income households. Also something that was mentioned by Ms. Schumacher, I believe was how do we not outsource or why we don't outsource for water and we depend on rainfall. Um, that's understandable about the rainfall, but why don't we re outsource, you know, just a thought. Um, um, also, so we didn't vote for, for you guys to raise our rates and fees. We already have a hard time as it is, and the board members have run their campaigns claiming they will consider us rate payers and lower the amount we pay for some service and consumption, and uh, we as community mem members trust that those of you who we voted for would make good on your promises to us in the community, and that has not happened. That's all. Are there any anyone else wants to speak up? I see so many people there. Okay. Public comment is no. Great. If you'd like, um, we can take a minute to respond to some of these thoughtful questions. Uh, yeah. Would you like for us to do that? So I'm going to ask my colleagues here. I know, Moni, you were taking notes. Um, Leslie, you were probably listening. So uh, I'll just try to go through the way I heard them, if that's most appropriate. And forgive me if I miss somebody's specific comment, trying to take it all in. So. The, the, you know, there's two sides of the equation. What is, what do you have to do to pull money in? But also, what are you doing to, to, to save money, right? And, you know, that's, that's a legitimate question because it seems like, you know, government's looked at as just spin, 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 and they don't really reflect on how to uh, be more efficient, save money, and that sort of thing. So 
I'll, I'll throw out a few things here. Uh, I'm going to start big and then try to give you some specifics. This is by means, not all, but it's it, what I'm trying to do is just give you a little insight into how we work, okay? Because it's impossible for me to, to give you everything, but th what we do. But from the very beginning, staff is one of our largest costs. We have held staffing uh, constant for, I know, the last eight, ten years. We had a little blip, and then I ended up cutting three people. So that, that's the, the, the big picture. We periodically come back to the board, and these are in different memos, looking at this specific topic of how do we, how do we save money, how do we become more efficient. Um, and so the, I'm going to give you some, some things here. So a couple examples that I'll just put in just to give you the, the real touch points. So I think probably... Four years ago, as we were building Pure Water Soquel, we saw a moment in time where we could save about 200 grand if we had a, a board meeting early or we were able to get to the board and pre-purchase that building uh, before the price inflation costs went up. Somebody mentioned inflation. We were able to do that. It was going out of limb a little bit because that big blue building that you see down there at Chanticleer, we were able to purchase that. It's not so much the savings there, what I'm trying to get to you, but it's us monitoring that, seeing a moment where we can actually save some money, and so we, we jump on it. That's just one, one little thing. We have, written, we have a leak adjustment policy, and whether you agree with this or not, it, we've written off, I think, about 200 k a year in trying to help people who have leaks and that the bill gets very high. That's not necessarily a, um, a savings, but it's a way to look at it. Um, We've negotiated with our meter vendors um, and repeaters that which have saved about 25k. We charge. We've changed out all the large meters ourselves instead of contracting it out, which is another um, 100k. We look at every position, and I can tell you, staff goes through agony on this. Anytime somebody retires or steps out, we stop. We put the brakes on everything, and I say, okay, let's take a moment. What's changed? that we don't, what we, what are we doing that we don't need to do and we, what do we got to do in the future? So just recently, we had somebody retire. We repurposed basically that position to something else that we need, that we know we were going to need in the future. So we kind of eliminated a position but filled that one that's coming up. So those are a few. And somebody mentioned uh, we have some temporary um, employees. How many do we have? Two? Who we do. We, we try not to, if we think we're going to just need somebody for a short time, we try to just uh, hire them for two to three years because we don't want to keep them on the payroll long term, right? So it's another way. And usually, you know, there are people out there looking for that. So it's a, it's a good deal for them and I think a good deal for our customers. Um, I don't know. If you've been following us, we looked, we did about a year-long process. We had another, I don't know if it was an ad hoc or public committee at uh, – how can we work with the uh, city of Scotts Valley or the, the water district of Scotts Valley? Where can we find cost-efficient savings? It's kind of like they did with the fire department, right? So is it our HR? Is it we can share equipment at a certain time? And that didn't pan out, but we tried. And really what we saw was Scotts Valley probably got a much better uh, cut out of it than SoCal would of their, our customers. So we didn't do that. But the point is, is we... We, we evaluated that. Um, and there's, there's, those are just some examples on that particular question. We continue to, to look at cost. But did you want to add anything? I'll move on to the next question. Okay. So it is foremost in our mind. And I'll tell you, somebody mentioned we're like a monopoly. We, we kind of are. But you know what? I constantly say we cannot act that way. That is not who, who we are. You know, that's not in our DNA because we do have control of the, of, the, of the water, so to speak. We constantly are mindful of that, and I, and I take that to the core. So the second question that I heard, family of six, uh, larger families, as you heard tonight, the two new, um, I heard two of you, uh, uh, family of six, um, the lady who came up first, and then I think Anthony, maybe you or somebody. 
uh, these rate structures, and Dr. LeHue inferred from it, it's a balance. When we we have to collect so much money to do to do the, um, the work that needs to be done, we don't want to end up like the basin that you see up in San Lorenzo, where the water district just folded, right? And you see that you see that around. So our board's been consistent about periodically just keeping keeping it moving, investing in the infrastructure, but the um, where was I going with this idea? The, oh, the, the, the rate structures are meant, the, the ones that the, the Water Rates Advisory Committee is looking at, to try to find, uh, help those who probably need it the most. The assumptions made the larger families need the break the most. And that's what these rate structures that are being recommended by the Water Rates Advisory Committee are proposing to do with the larger families. Okay, you can be fixed income in a larger family. That's the double whammy, right? So that's, that's the, there, the idea there. The PG&E, the care, we do, have th we do have items that we try to, the Lee WAP and programs that are funded by the state, but we're not a private entity like PG&E is. The real nexus, and this gets to somebody else's question about the tax, is we have to show a nexus. We can't have one customer class subsidize another. So you can't say, well, certain people are wealthy or let's, let's stick it to the businesses or whatever. You, can, you just can't do that. By law, we have to show in our, in our record that uh, there's, a, there's a, a scientific uh, nexus there. So now I'm telling you all this, but it's, I'm trying to do it in a way that's not defensive. I heard somebody just speak in the public. Uh, it's just, I'm just trying to respond and give you honest answers to your questions here. So regarding the rainfall in a good year, uh, great question. It's crazy. We get about 30, 20 inches of rain here up in the mountains. They get about 80, at least in Bonnie Dune, right? So where, where's all the water going? Well, two things. We've, ev we've evaluated all these options. Uh, the, 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 there's a couple fundamental things. When it rains, it usually rains in a very short, high intensity, short duration. So it's, you have to have very large vessels to capture that. It doesn't, it's not cost effective. The city has a reservoir they've had, um, and it's the, it's the only thing we have like that. Now we have looked at the city and we have an ongoing program. We started it about eight years ago to try to transfer water with the city of Santa Cruz. I would say with anything, they've probably needed more water from us than they were able to supply us. So that hasn't been as, turned out as hopeful as we wanted. The other thing we did is we had a study done, again, about rainfall. Andy Fisher up at UCSC, and this is on our website, I'm sure, about where can we recharge our basin? Where can we make big catch basins and let it infiltrate? We don't have a good basin for that for the majority of our basin. It's like a pancake layer, so there's sand, there's, there's a clay layer, sand, clay, so you can't just stick it on top. It won't infiltrate down. In the aromas red sands, there's a little bit more opportunity for that, but we've only been able to find very, very small, like 1% of our, of our recharge. But we have looked at that option extensively. ADUs, um, somebody said about the cost of those. There, it's a, it's a, the, we're driven by the law on that for the most part. Some ADUs, the ones that are, have existing structure and aren't too small, the vast majority of them get, don't have to pay a hookup fee. And then new ones do currently. So I will say that. Um, how let's see how rates included in infiltration? I can't make do with that question. Why are we not cutting back on cost? Uh, just can't understand that. I think that was you, Miss Kirby. Uh, I've given a um, a couple examples there. The somebody in line with that asked, well, if you can't cut back on cost, how can you get other revenue? Our really only source of revenue. It are, is selling water. And here's the crazy thing about selling water, okay? This is a, a kind of a tough concept. Whether we supply 100 gallons or 100 million to you out there, our costs are about 97% the same. And that's just to have water ready for you to use. Again, so when water use goes down, that's our only source of revenue, but yet we still incur the same cost. And it's a function of what they call a high-intensity capital uh, endeavor, such as a water agency. 
And it's our nemesis. Who's out there saying, who has a business that says, don't buy our product, right? And then when you do don't buy it, our revenue, which is all we have, goes down, except you can go out for grants and loans. And that's where we have been exceptionally successful, greater probably than I would say many fold over than any agency our size relative to our thing. And that's because of the staff, the board, going to places, driving to places, attending regional water boards, state water board meetings, talking to the Federal Bureau of Reclamation, and here are the numbers. Help me out with the numbers. The state water board, the most prominent figure in the state of California, the state water board, $50 million grant for our project. Nobody our size gets that. Then they went back and saw some escalation going on in our project. How much did they add, Melanie? Another $13 million. It didn't stop there. They even offered us a low interest loan uh, to go beyond that. Then we didn't stop there. We went to the federal government. We went back to D.C. Yeah, you can say, oh, what cost to fly to D.C.? It does, but these are calculated risk to, to say, we'll put this much money in to get this much money. And the board even questioned it at the very beginning. I said, I think, I can't guarantee it, but I think it's a good, good, I don't want to say gamble, but a good use of, of ratepayer fund. So we've, I don't know how much we spent, but you know, imagine three or four people flying back. 30 million. That just happened last week. 30 million. They only in one small span have ever given out more than 20 million, you know, and then this year we hit we hit the jackpot with 30 million. So that didn't stop there. So then we go to EPA, US EPA, and we know we we want money to fund the the uh, pure water, this is for pure water uh, SoCal project. And at the time, we were trying to borrow. They, they, do, a, they do loans. They don't do uh, grants. The others are grants, just free money, except you got a mantra and stuff like that. 88, 88 okay, let's call it 90 million, 89 million, roughly. And uh, 1.3% 1. 1. interest. And, I, and here's another insight to us. When we were watching that a couple of years ago, that interest rate, it was a struggle amongst us three. We were watching this interest rate, I mean, by the hour going, okay, it's going down, it's going up. And the argument here was, hey, it's gonna, it may drop down to 1.2, wait to lock in. The argument here is going to go up um, quickly, so lock in. So we locked it in at one point, what did you say, two? 1.3% interest. Look where the interest rates are today. They're around 7 8%, something like that. So that saves millions and millions of dollars on top of, of the other money. So, you know, we, are, we, 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 we put ourselves out there. We struggle to do what we can. And, and yet, I, I get it. It's not easy. You're looking at, we're looking at rate increases, and it's, it's tough. But, you know, there's a, there's a project down south. Is it Grover? River Beach. Anyway, they're looking at about 20, 25 percent. There's another uh, uh, outfit out there. And what they're, why their rates have to be so high is because they haven't invested over time. A long time ago, about 20 years ago, our board saw the need for a, a, a project like this. And they said, start investing in that infrastructure now so we don't have to spike rates like 50 percent like some of these agencies have to do. Another way we're looking at revenue is uh, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency had to be formed as an umbrella agency over this agency, which we're a part of, the county, the city of Santa Cruz, um, Central Water District, and three private well owners. And the idea is there that they're responsible for the basin being in basin uh, or in uh, sus reaching sustainability and by 2040. Uh, otherwise, the state will come in and they've said it to my face, and they will cut everybody back. They're not going to institute a project. Cut everybody back, and when that happens, we get even less revenue and rates go up more. It's like that, that if you, maybe, I don't know if we can pull it up, but Melanie showed you a diagram, an economic study done by Brent, Dr. Haddad up at UCSC, and what that study said, without the supplemental supply that's costing us some money, right? It's, a two, it's a basically a $180 million project. We thought it was going to be about 190, 90 or 100 million. But that project is actually cheaper, and we have a slide if I need to show it, to the rate payer than when we originally projected, even with it almost doubling cost because of we got more grant funding and rates to offset it. Now, where does that happen? 
that what we told you the project was going to cost is actually going to cost a rent payer more. I know it went up. We were struggling. We were looking at all kinds of sophisticated Monte Carlo curves and dealing with inflation that's going up. COVID hits us. It's going to cost the rate payers less, yes, with it, with, because of the, that funding. The other thing, I, going back to the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, part of the endeavor that's going on there now, and somebody mentioned this, and believe me, this is not lost on us, is we pump, I don't know, out of the basin, maybe 60% of the water. So we're saying, hey, yeah, we're solving the problem. Yeah, and that's why the state is recognizing us. You heard this. This was no joke at the meeting. People are like, you're the model. This is why the state and the federal government, they want us to crack the code on being a sustainable community that's a smaller community, and, we, and we'll be the first to do it. And that's why they're investing in us. But we're also saying, hey, there's a lot of other pumpers, over 1,000 other pumpers. There's Cabrillo. There's the golf course. There's, I can name them. And there's a, there's a lot of private pumpers, too. We're not asking them to, to pitch in. We're considering them de minimis. But we are going to look at and say, hey, if you're part of the problem, we think you should be part of the solution. It shouldn't all weigh on our, our rate payers. And so there's, a, there's an endeavor to uh, go to that. You will see that if you go to the NGA, Mid-County Groundwater Agency meetings, you'll see that lay out next two weeks, whenever the next meeting is, and it'll probably take a year or two to get through that process. Um, the, oh, yeah, the thank you so, so much. The property tax thing I wanted to touch on, that, that, that or the, the having somebody else pay more, I don't want, I'm not a lawyer, the old caveat, right? Uh, but you can't, again, I think that crosses the bounds of Prop 218 where one customer class offsets another uh, customer class. But still, um, take it under consideration, we'll go back. Uh, Melanie mentioned the optimization study. That's another big thing. Oh, we got another $7.6 $6 million in grant funding. The MGA did, of which we pay the lion's share. So we, we took about, I don't know, two, two million of that, and we're trying to look at how with the city of Santa Cruz can we optimize uh, the water situation. So whether they have excess water or whatever, but one of the big components is is when, they're, when it gets times of drought, they don't have water. And so a recycle system like Pure Water SoCal is, we can run constantly and put, have a, a, a round the year uh, source of water. So here's the, here's the cool part. And this is why I think the, the federal government gave us $30 million, is when they said, why should we give you water? I said, well, we're critically overdrafted. Hey, a lot of other basins are hurting too. Uh, we're trying like heck, we're doing this X. So are the other ones. Well, our board said, go ahead, if you're going to build this project, make it in such a way that the rest of the community can benefit from it if they need to, because we think they were going to need to. So all that traffic you're stuck in the road, part of that's us. A lot of it, probably nine, there's like nine projects going on. One of the projects is pure water. But that, the pipes, instead of being this big, they're this big. And the reason they're that big is so the plant can double in size. When you go to the facility, there's three pumps. It has room for three more pumps. So the, the, everything below ground is doubled in size, and everything above ground is able to fit for double capacity. So this optimization study, we got a $7.6 million grant, of which we're using $2 million. We're working with um, the city of Santa Cruz to see how we may optimize those, those projects. To the benefit of us, but to the benefit of the whole community, right? So that's another way um, we're trying to... Uh, Save the customer money. Uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there. I'm, I, I don't know if I missed any questions. If I did, I'd be glad to answer them, but I tried to, to write most of them down here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd also like to just point out this is a, our overdraft problem started, you know, we became aware of this 30 years ago, 40 years ago even. And searching, we've been searching for a solution. The district has been searching for a solution for that long. And we are now within reach of a project, a viable project that will provide the first uh, supplement, supplementary water to our district in 50 years. So we, this is a new source of water. We're doing everything we can to make sure the state requires us to make sure it's purer than the water that we inject will be purer than the existing water or equal to it. 
which is one of the reasons why we cannot automatically inject the San Lorenzo water into our aquifer. That would be a contamination issue. So, yes, just just keep in mind that it, there are very strict laws about what you put into your groundwater. Uh, anyway, uh, we are now within reach of that. We, The whole district has worked and struggled hard to pay for it with the least expense to our customers. Uh, I'd also like to point out that uh, the state has, uh, and Leslie Strom has been working with the state to provide a way for uh, people who have limited income to pay their water bill or support for their water bills. And uh, not that many people have looked into it, but you should if you have that issue. There is a low-income household water assistance program available to low-income customers, and anybody that's interested in applying can definitely contact the district, and we'll get them on the right track. Do that. Is it on the website? Yeah, it is. And okay. yes, you should. There's a lot of information on our website, actually, but um, it, it might take a long time to plow through it. But it's. There's a lot of information. Um, I have some other things, but does anyone want, want to talk? <laughs> I can wait. No, go ahead. What? Yeah. Yeah, as to your comment, I, that would be really nice. I'm not sure we have, we, uh, due to increased conservation, I think we, you know, we're nine, $9 million in the hole, and I'm not sure we have saleable property that is equal to anywhere near equal to that, um, that amount of money. We could balance that out with any kind of a property sale. I'm sorry. We can certainly look into that. I think uh, besides the property sale, there's um, uh, also potential legal ramifications, because I did explore that in the last day or two heard that thought. Uh, one thing that can be done, though, is that can go on as the process goes on. I mean, the process can go on, and if something does come to fruition like that, because it takes time, uh, as mentioned before, and as the board has done before, they can set the rates and say, hey, we got, you know, X million dollars, and uh, we don't have to raise rates as much as we thought. And, we, and the board has done that before. Actually, we maybe perhaps should have done that in the last three years, but because we we didn't have the uh, sell as much water as predicted by our budget, and uh, but we didn't raise the rates above what we had. The two eighteen process said we could do that. But, uh, I don't have a conversation. Uh, I mean, we don't we don't speak from the public like that. It's the board chair to ask if you want to if she wants you to come up to the mic. So, for one, you're not on on the television being recorded, and so to the audience watching it, it, it doesn't make sense. So, but again, that's the board's discretion. Yeah, you won't be heard on the TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not in the public realm. No, no, but we are commenting on the public. President Christensen. There was also a question, and maybe we can address it, which was um, whether or not inflation was included in these proposed rates, and maybe Kevin or, or Leslie can answer that. Yes, we did include inflation in the proposed rates. Um, we included inf inflation at a slightly higher amount the first two years of the rate study, and then dropped back down to a normal 2 to 3 percent general inflation rate for the following uh, couple of years. Sorry, I thought we were looking at the rate structure in order to figure out a way to balance it to make it more equitable, if we like, for people that have bigger families or other uses. We're not determining the rates right now. Well, Correct? the depending on if you were if you were interested in choosing one of the rate structures that was presented tonight there are rates available for those structures. We did, sh we did share those with you tonight. That was just a 
even like if we're using what we're doing now, what we'd have to do with, yeah. That's that's a 12% annual revenue need. Increase. Right, that was just a, um, an, a number to compare the rates. No, we did we did do that with rate the rates structures. with the rate uh, water rates advisory committee as we looked at rate structures rate structures with zero increase in rates so that we could do that comparison. The rates we presented this evening included that twelve percent increase in revenue need for each of the four years. So are we choosing a rate structure or are we choosing a rate? You're choosing a you're choosing a rate structure. If there's no um, adjustments to that structure, then you would also be looking at these rates. We're not approving the rates. We're approving a rate structure. A rate structure, and a, and then the rates themselves and the draft report will be brought back to you at the December nineteenth meeting for final approval. Right, because I think things are like getting convoluted. We're not approving rates tonight. No. We're really directing staff to go back and tell them whether they need to come back on December 5th with some other alternatives to look at or whether we're happy with one of these four rate, rate structures. structures. Correct. We're not we're not making any other decisions tonight. And no. Some of the rate structures will be reducing people's monthly rate because they're using a lot more water than others. Correct. The couple here this evening that had the large family would probably see a reduction in their Yeah, they would see a reduction in people that water their lawn and, you know, have dogs that don't like um, fake lawns can, will have a rate, we'll see a reduction. Depending on the rate structure. Right. So, it, it, so you know, the feedback should be coming from people saying which rate stu structure they'd prefer yep. rather than saying don't raise rates because we're not looking at raising rates tonight. We're looking at what rate structure we're going to use because some people will benefit and have a, a, lo a lower bill based on which rate structure we, we choose. So I, you know, I'm sitting here listening to all that and I'm going, wait, first you got to decide how you think we should be doing the rates to benefit some people and it's going to be a detriment to others. I happen to be in the very low end of the rates of the water use, so I'll be paying, and I don't have a problem with it, more money if we pick one of the other rate structures. So, I mean, that's my comment. I kind of, I think we've lost track of what we're doing tonight. Oh, I don't think so. I. Th I I think we, I wanted to hear what everyone was thinking about the whole. We're going to hear it again in a, in a month. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. But, but it's still, it is still information, and I did take lots of notes. <laughs> yeah, I have something. What? I have a question. Okay. Um, so I would think that inflation definitely affects all of us too. And as Ron mentioned, a lot of our costs are staff costs and our staff, you know, has to deal with inflation just like everyone else. So we, so that part of it, we really, really want to make sure, sure that, I mean, we can't change that part of it. Um, I don't think it's a bad exercise to have each department. And I mentioned this years ago, look and see, you know, if they had to cut back by 5% or 10%, where would they cut? So they're prepared to do that if we end up, I mean, obviously taking, taking care of our groundwater basin is our number one goal and it's gonna cost some money to do that. And we've come a long way and I'm, I'm very thankful that we have worked this way, but, and it's not, gonna, it's not gonna make the cost go away, but I do think we should try and be as efficient as possible. Um, I also, as far as this rate structure, um, when I, it, first of all, I think it would have helped me too to have the slides ahead of time, just for future meetings, because all that specific information on the different options wasn't there. And I like to study that. Um, 
But one of the things that bothers me, and I understand the desire to cover more of the fixed costs with a fixed you know, service charge, but I, it bothers me the amount that looks like it's going to affect the lower users, the amount on their bill. And I'm not, it, it's, but yeah. And so I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable just saying, okay, well, let's just go with 50%. I, I, want, I think I want to see the numbers leaving it where it was too and see what the difference in effect on everybody is. Because um, I don't, you know, it's just a large dollar increase for some of the lower water users that have been trying to do their best. I understand we all got to cover the price of a sustainable basin, and I'm happy to do my part, but I just, I want to see that options include one that doesn't have quite as significant an impact on those lower water users um, as far as the structure. Yeah, it's, it's really a dilemma because at the last rate, uh, the last time we had a rate meeting, we were limited to two tiers. It was, that was in, in previous uh, rate meeting, rate studies, we had, what, four tiers at some point? We have at one point. Yeah, one point, and that well, provided for that gradations. <laughs> but um, so the concern was for larger families getting stuck with a higher cost of water. So. We're trying to balance all of these uh, considerations in this rate structure, and uh, that is why the rate um, the rate committee members, the citizens that were volunteered for that committee, anyone could have volunteered for that, as long as they were in the district. Yeah, um, I have something to say. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's what they chose the three. That was their preference. Was the third, the three tier was to let know the rates increase gradually for, you know, most, over 70% of the users. So. So can I talk? Yeah. <laughs> the, the reason we went up to 50% is because we came in short because of low water, water usage. And we're trying to make sure that the district doesn't go, um, you know, doesn't go any deeper in debt because of people using less water. And that's why it went up to 50, and that's why you talked about 60%, because that way we have a more um, stable income. Mm -hmm. So that's what was discussed in the, in the, in the um, meetings. I wanted to add one very quick point. It's just that, um, I mean, of course, I'm in the lowest user group too, but the thing is is that 70% of our users are in the lowest group. And, and that is why it works yeah. um, uh, uh, to put a little increase on the 70% to raise a lot of money. Um, just the voice so of big picture. Where are you? Um, <laughs> first of all, we, we do have to be solvent. We have to meet revenue uh, needs to keep certain ratios at certain levels. Um, those are givens. How we do it, um, we have the flexibility in both rate st structures on how we apportion uh, the needs. We also have the possibility, and I support uh, what Tom said about, you know, let's look and see if, if there are ways to cut. Um, but putting things in the, the real big picture, there's some just huge, huge um, decisions that have been made by the board that have saved our customers an incredible amount of money. One was refinancing some um, some debt when the interest rates was low. That that's uh, saved a lot of money. 
I saved about um, seven million dollars, Dr. Jaffe. How much was that? Seven million. Seven million. Yeah. So, and I think that we unfortunately do have to raise rates. I'm a, a rate payer. I don't like paying higher rates for water. I don't think anyone does. I'm open to solutions that would make a significant impact um, on decreasing the costs for the district. Um, but actually, I think we're at a situation where we have an aging infrastructure and we have to maintain that. And if we don't, it's going to cost us a lot of money down the down the road. And I'm talking near future, not decades away. I'm talking years away, where if we don't maintain this our infrastructure, we will um, have to respond quickly and inefficient inefficiently to main breaks. Etc. And so we we have to do that. The Pure Water Soquel uh, project to stop seawater in, intrusion or to slow it. I don't think it's an option not to do something. Um, it gets mentioned that we should just get water from Santa Cruz. They're not giving us any water. They have very, they have, they have problems of their own and they have very strict, um, a strict set of rules for when they will give water. And they haven't been able to uh, give us water many of the years that we've had an agreement with them. So, but I do agree that uh, we a, a three tiered system gives us more flexibility on on how we um, can raise the revenue and adhere to as much as possible to to fairness equity. So I, I support that. Um, at one point we had five tiers, uh, maybe a dozen years ago or so. Um, so in terms of a rate structure, that that's what I'd like to see us uh, use and then work out the details on how the, um, the costs are apportioned um, that do match um, the cost of the water and also at the same time um, have a fairness overlay on them. So that's where I'm at with all this. So what we is, could uh, what we could do is we could I'm I'm listening to, to the feedback. What we could do is we could bring back um, at the uh, hold a December 5th meeting, we could bring back some rate structures that showed the same fixed versus variable allocation that we have right now, which I believe is about 46, 64, 46, 54, sorry. We're about 46% fixed right now. We are? Yeah. It, it, we started out 40%, but over the last three years of the rate study, because we've brought so much less in on the commodity side, the reality of it has been that we're closer. So we can either do what we are doing right now, which is about the 46% fixed, or we can go ahead and drop it back down to 40, or we can do both. We can model a 40 and a 46 uh, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to see that. 
Okay. Uh, I don't know what the other directors think. We'll, we'll be back um, to not having the, the thing, funds come through thing, because of water use. We will we will be putting ourselves in a position where if water use decreases substantially, then we will not have collected the revenue that we needed. Correct. And I th I think that's not prudent to do that. I mean, one of the goals is financial sustainability, which we have to have, right? We have to meet our costs. Another one is the fairness thing. So I'm just, I'm. Fairness there, there would be 100%. Everybody pay that. I'm just talking about the increase in one year. Well, I have a question. I don't know gradual. if any of the other directors or people in the audience were thinking this. Is, is there a way to ramp up um, rather than have as big a, you know, 12% the first year. I guess that comes from the uh, fixed portion of the costs. Is there a way to ramp that fixed portion up? I know it's complicated, but instead of saying, you know, it's 50%, from the start in all four years, is there a way to, I'm gonna to have go to up from, from less? I'm going to have to defer that one to Kevin um, or Josh. Is there a way for us to begin with a 40% fixed component and raise it over the course of the four-year study? Perhaps I'll take that first and then uh, Josh can weigh in. We would not advise trying to phase in that increase because it, it needs to be based on the cost of providing service. And so unless we can demonstrate, mm. it, it would almost be like we're doing the cost of service every for each year of the four years. Um, I think the alternative that would um, that might get to the same place or a similar place is instead of talking about 12%, uh, revenue increases each year, that those would start lower and then have to be higher at the end of the term. But that also has cash timing implications. So I would say no on the phasing in, Okay. Um, but you could potentially look at a lower overall revenue increase in the first uh, year, which means they would then have to be higher in future years. Um, but we also, you know, we need to work with staff to see what's the impact on debt service coverage and kind of minimum cash balances if we were to do that. Can I ask a question? Didn't we look at that already? And but as a committee and it was. It wasn't sustainable, I don't believe. Right, it wasn't sustainable because we did look at that. I, I think what we looked at was the 10% uh, kind of uniformly. I think what, you know, there's a world where the first year is six or seven or eight percent but then what we have to be mindful of is year two might have to be 15 or 16 percent so all you're doing is trading you're trading one year for the uh, the other uh, yeah. and and ending you know your end point after four years gets you to about the same place well that's the revenue requirement end of things that's and correct i mean unless you reduce costs or Increase water use, which you know, who knows how that'll go. So, if we were to bring back um, the three-tier structure, do you want to see the modified two-tier as well, or are you okay? So, the modified two-tier and the three-tier structure, with a different allocation between fixed and commodity charges, right? Okay, we can bring we can bring that back for a review. And if you have any other great ideas of how to soften the blow, I'm I'm open. Well, there was that one proposal about um, uh, doing the three tiered, um, but increase in the third tier. We could move some of the conservation costs. I think that's eighty four cents per unit mm -hmm. from tier two to tier three, and that would increase. Tier three by eighty four cents and decrease tier two by eighty four cents. So that is an option as well. It sends a stronger conservation signal to tier three. What we're doing is we're recovering all of our conservation costs from tier three users. I think that we should look at that too. Okay. 
we can look at that as well. And it has to be justified as well. Right. If you have this information before the meeting, that'd be great. Okay. This was a little, I felt a little bit like, oh, okay, first time I've seen it. Okay, so. I was um, on the committee, I'm sure you didn't feel like that, but for, for me, it's like a lot to take in all at once. So for the motions, I believe the first motion we have is whether or not the, the directors want us to proceed with the 12% annual rev revenue need. To be. Oh, is that what that was? Oh, that's right. I see it. Yeah. Is, what, is that the scenario that you prefer we move forward with rather than the 25% and then the seven and a half, seven and a half, seven and a half? Saying overall over the four years? Correct. It would be 12% annual expense. Oh. Mama says close the file. Right, well, we, had, we had the option that's of... That's what's needed, right? The 12% right? is what's needed. Correct. You also had the meeting. option of 25% in year one followed by 7.5%. Well, that's, that's not a good option. Okay, so the 12.5%, or I mean the 12%, you would like to make a motion for us to continue with that finance plan scenario. I'll make the motion. I'll second. And, and President Christensen, um, we certainly can do this by motion, but if, if the board would prefer to just do it by consensus direction, that, that's an option as well. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Because yeah. I'm not totally I didn't sure. think. <laughs> well, I so was just reminded yeah. that our last uh, race study called for a 9% increase, and really it was hardly noticed in our income rate increases in the 9% wage, that consistent. Um, and I wanted to like prevent that from happening. So then the because second of bullet. Lower water use? Yeah, it's, it, well, you could see it, you could see it in the uh, uh, production, you know, the production, it was flattening, decreasing. It was much less than what the budget was based on. So the second bullet point would be to provide us direction regarding the proposed rate structure and have us return at the December 19th meeting, but it doesn't sound as though we are ready for that yet. No, no. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so now we're gonna direct staff to return to a board meeting on December 5th yes. Yes. with some new rate structure proposals that show the modified two-tier and the three-tier break points with varying cost allocations between the fixed component and the variable. Yes, please. And a possible change to the second. And, third. and a possible change to the conservation pricing on tier three. Um, can, can you do like 40%, 50%, 60% for the fixed? And then um, I know that in our meetings you had um, shown how that's going to affect us as far as our ability to maintain the proper amount of um, revenue uh, coverage. Yeah, we can we can model that 40%, 50%, and 60% fixed. Okay. Yeah, because you want to keep the fixed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we're no longer considering the uniform rate or the existing two tier. We're looking only Correct. now at the modified and the three tier. Right. Okay. We all agree on that. Okay. Uh -huh, yeah. And that was the yeah. that was a consensus of the Water Rates Advisory Committee. Yeah, and they did. I, I want to thank them for for all the work they've done. Yeah, and thank you guys for mm -hmm. doing that. Okay. I have yeah, a marching orders then. Oh, we have to close the meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is it clear or do you need a motion? I think we're, we're going to pass on the motion. I, I think we are. Yeah. I think we're clear. Understanding on this. Okay. We're going to go more in depth on um, focusing options. on the, the options related, but sticking with the modified two tier and the three tier structures, but just looking at tweaking those to see and get, um, you know accommodate more, more financial concerns. 
the rate plans. And I and I did hear that people are not happy with the increase in in water rates. Mm -hmm. And I heard especially there are people low income where the water rates are really um, having an effect on them. And so, Leslie, I, I know you've worked hard to get the, the word out that there is a program, but uh, I'd like to see that become more prominent we can do some on our web page. Okay. And in our email blasts, That's et cetera. Wonderful. Was it a, a dollar a hundred cubic foot a month? Is that what the increase looked like? The increase uh -huh. was a dollar, roughly a dollar per day per household. Per day per household, not regardless of what range you were in. That was at five units, about five units a month. Yeah, they, it was broken down to the... So it was like $30 a month. Right. Is that enough information? That's enough information. Thank you. Is it enough information for everybody here? It is enough information for you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And the, there is going to be a workshop on this workshop. or an outreach. What? There's going to be a workshop there, on this topic. Correct. I, there will be an open house. After we mail out the Prop 218 notices, we will be holding okay. a public open house for customers to come in and, and ask their questions. Okay. All right. Um, are we finished with this item now? Yes. Everybody's had a section. Okay, then we have to go back to the consent agenda. Item 4.7. Yeah, I pulled it, so I have some suggestions. I don't know who's. Why don't you go for it, Tom? I've only got one. No, I had a lot of English. Questions, well, so I figured you. I mean, <laughs> you know, one one of my things is just to try and make it more accessible to the audience. Um, so on page three, which it's hard to find, you know, but it's the one with the um, starts with SCADA upgrades on the top and um, rates at the bottom. Um, that's the page three, which is I have it as page one ninety three of the one ninety three of the packet. Um, so, with SCADA upgrades, it doesn't really say what the purpose of it is. So, it's great to say that we're doing this, but and and at least the acronym is defined, which you know is important for me. But I don't think people understand that that's so that we can monitor all of our systems and make sure that they're all running smoothly. Just something simple explanation about what the purpose of it is um, would be great. Um, on the next paragraph, I don't know if everybody knows what O&M is. Okay, so operations and maintenance should be defined. Um, on the same column, water distribution modeling, it's just, um, a little bit technical and maybe I think it needs to be put in words to explain to people what it's actually doing. So, and then under water smart, I thought they, while you're describing it is encourage more people to sign up, explain it a little more and why it helps them and, and just encourage them to sign up at least. Um, and then finally on the next page, um, I feel like, there's another opportunity to explain the problem. So I thought the explanation of seawater intrusion should be at the top um, and then connect to how Pure Water SoCal is going to solve that problem. Because it explains, explains it, but I just, it, I don't know, I just felt like it doesn't kind of, ex you've got the, the description of seawater intrusion, but not how the, Swip wells will actually stop that. You can have a little diagram that just had that. It's just an opportunity for explanation. That's it. Bruce, you had something? So you were talking about hydrology 101? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the comment I had as well. 
um, the first sentence needs to be changed. Seawater intrusion is a condition whereby groundwater is withdrawn at a faster rate than it can be replenished by rainfall. You know, that's, there's more to it than that. So it's, that's one of the causes, but it, uh, it should be mentioned that it's a coastal aquifer and, um, and it's a, it's a causation, not a condition. So I'm happy to, if somebody reaches out to me to provide an alternate sentence, but I don't have it right now, but it, that needs to be changed. I'll take responsibility for that and, and amend it. And if we think we're even close to not having it right, we'll send it out to you for review. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you can modify it. Okay. I think you need to vote. Oh yes. Or is that informational? I, I believe it says direct staff to make changes. It's not a motion. Yeah. Yeah. So we we've done that. Okay. We we can should be able to take that. And then we should have public comment as well on this if there's anybody left. There is a person here. Left. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Becky Steinbrunner, thank you. Um, you know, when I hear people talking about the um, the flyers, these what's on tap things that come out to them, a lot of people don't even read them. Here is an opportunity on the front page to put it very clearly that your rates are going to go up and put it in that simple, bold term. Here is another opportunity to provide people with the information that is available for those who are struggling. You heard people here tonight that say they have to borrow sometimes to pay their bill. So a lot of people don't know. And yes, maybe it's on the website, but how many people actually go digging around on the website? It's not the easiest website to manipulate, uh, uh, to maneuver, I'll tell you that. So please use the very front page of the What's on Tap to clearly let people know their rates are going up. Let people know there's financial assistance that helps them right now and available if they apply. Thank you. I agree, Becky. Um, okay. The meeting is closed now. We're ready for a closed session. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. And then, so, uh, President Christian, we said, should allow oh boy. public comment before closed session. Pardon me? Oh, no. that's right. You're allowed. Yeah, sorry. To, excuse me. I almost forgot. That's all right. We're all tired. <laughs> Um, I, again, I just want to say that I have not wanted to take any of the legal action, and I know that it has cost um, the district repairs to take this legal action, but um, I do believe and continue to believe it's important. It, it has vexed me that um, Best, Best and Krieger, I guess with the authorization of staff, has very frequently flown up from Riverside for the day and just even last week for 15 minutes when um, she could have been online like most of the other attorneys were. So there's a cost cutting thing that could happen. But I will just say that um, had the district done, for example, the final anti-degradation analysis sooner than March of 2023, um, some, of the, some of the costs could have been reduced. I mean, this recent change in microfiltration and that has caused um, the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board to put it out for comment again because there's been a modification to the system. Uh, had that been done in the beginning, as is what is the law, it could have saved some money for the ratepayers. So um, 
I'm sorry that I've had to take this action. I've learned a lot, and I've done it only for public benefit and never uh, as a vexatious effort. It's always been in good faith for the best of what I see of the environment and for the ratepayers. Thank you.